right, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, this uh, I'm Tony Mizuko, town manager for the town of Norwood. This is one of our town meeting information sessions. Uh, we're joined by a number of officials. Um, Bill Plasco is on the line somewhere. Paul Helkiotis is on the line. Uh, Patrick Deshane from the planning department. We have Joe Collins from my office um, and other town staff and members of the finance commission are here as well. So tonight we're gonna go through a review of our town meeting articles. I'm gonna take some of them. Paul Helkiotis is gonna take some of the land use articles. We'll start with questions as we go through them. Uh, if we get too many questions, we may just pause and get through them. I mean, the presentation is actually very simple. It's just really what's on the screen at town meeting, uh, but we'll take questions and um, any questions we don't have answers to, we'll continue to um, get answers to. Um, they'll just join us. And um, if we do have to go on a little bit longer, uh, or if we do have to wait till the end, we'll do that as well. So we'll, um, we'll play it by ear in terms of getting our attention. Uh, we can start with the raise hand function like we would do at town meeting, or you can try to drop something in the chat. We'll just see how busy it is we'll uh, and how that'll impact whether or not we need to um, wait till the end or have a different process. So that being said, before I get started with the presentation, are there any questions? Okay, has everyone signed up for one of the town meeting information sessions uh, or one of the practice sessions, I should say, if you, I should say if you haven't, you don't need to let me know whether you have or haven't. Um, it's a great idea to do it. It does take you through Zoom. Some of it's fairly basic Zoom, Zoom 101, if you will, but it does at least let you explain it. We have one left in, or let you understand it in the context of um, how we are going to do Zoom for town meeting. Because how you see the screen right now is not exactly how it's going to look for a town meeting. This is just a Zoom meeting. Town meeting will be a Zoom webinar, so you'll have a um, series of panelists who are staff presenting or the moderator, and you as town meeting members will just show up on a participant list. So it's a little bit different. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen here. Oh, uh, Joe, I think you're the host. Can you allow me to share my screen? See, always a technical issue. Well, that'll take just a minute while we'll, there we go. Now I can mute people too. All the power. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Does somebody want to give just a thumbs up that they can see the screen? All right, can somebody give me a verbal cue because I don't have my screen. Anymore. I can see it, Tony. All right, then that's perfect. We are good to go. And we're gonna go ahead and get started. As I told everyone, uh, feel free to just try to grab my attention. I'm gonna get my uh, participant list up here, sorry. Uh, raising a hand is probably the best way to do it. And uh, if not, you can just jump in because right now we have everyone uh, the ability to unmute themselves. All right, so we're gonna jump right into article one, which is the cemetery perpetual care account. So about uh, two and a half years ago, when the town was converting its accounting software over, we had to dig through um, probably 30 or 40,000 lines of accounting and software. And an error was discovered where money that should have accrued in the cemetery perpetual care account has actually accrued in what's known as the town's general fund. When you get buried in Norwood or most towns, uh, you can pay into perpetual care. And the idea is that that money is put into an account we only um, uh, we only allow um, the interest from that perpetual care account to be paid for cemetery expenses. The idea is, of course, you're paying for the perpetual care and upkeep uh, upkeep of a uh, of a gravesite. About one hundred and seventy thousand dollars had gone into the general fund, which just becomes free cash that should have went into the cemetery perpetual care fund. So we worked with our auditors in the state and their recommendation was that we go ahead and just move money from free cash into the cemetery perpetual care account where it will stay in perpetuity and we'd only be using it, um, the interest from it and not the principal from it, which is how the state law works with cemeteries. We also have our own unique way of spelling cemetery up there on article one, but I take responsibility for that. Uh, fairly straightforward article. Um, if there are no questions, I'd ask if somebody just wants to ask a question just so we can get familiar with the process. Does Julie Issa, do you want to ask a question? You mean to unmute and ask the question? Yeah, just so we're familiar oh, okay. with it. Um, how's everybody doing today? <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. I think everyone's probably doing uh, as best as can be considered, uh, as best as can be considered giving everything. So that's uh, cemetery perpetual care. Again, as we get to the end of the warrant, 
by all means, you can come back. Uh, we'll come back to any accounts or any questions people have questions about. Article two it would be appropriating money from our transportation fund or our rideshare funds for a trail around Haas Brook. Now these funds, believe it or not, when you take an Uber into Norwood or out of Norwood, the state assesses a tax and we get a small piece of that tax. It, in this case, it's about $19,000 a year. This number will come down, I'm assuming, um, quite a bit uh, in subsequent years as a result of um, COVID. But interestingly enough, in I believe calendar 2019, there were 190,000 Uber or Lyft or rideshare rides in Norwood that is either taking off or um, being dropped off. So translate to us only about 10 cents a ride, but there's about $19,000 there. It has to be appropriated annually for a transportation related um, item or anything that's supposed to offset the idea of uh, carbon transportation. So in the past, we've done bike racks. In this case, we're doing a small walking path. Um, it can be used for road repairs, for instance, but at 19 to $20,000 a year, that doesn't really get very much done for um, road work. So we're trying to look at different sustainability initiatives and different nice things we can do with the funds. This would um, allocate that for a walking path around uh, the Hosbrook area. Questions on Article 2? All right. Article 3 would appropriate money from free cash for Sorry, a classic. Tony, question. Yeah, go right ahead. Hey, it's Ed Ferris. Ed. Um, so the path going around Hawes Brook, we also have the cross country trails that go around Hawes Brook that are actually used by the track team on a regular basis. Are these going to impact those trails? No, not at all. Um, the trails committee worked on this one. This is more of a walking tra uh, walking path. It, it's an area that's sort of already identified, but it's not going to impact the cross country team. Okay. And, and won't, won't likely be of the same quality. We're, we're sort of cutting a brush path here. It's not going to be a nice wide flat path. Flattish. But great question. Okay. All right. Article three is a classification and compensation study. Uh, classification and compensation studies look at position descriptions and pay grades of positions in general government in the school uh, business staff. And they define pay grades according to complexity of the job and market comparability. Most organizations do some sort of a market study every couple of years, or if you have sort of baseline positions, if you have a lot of type A jobs, you're always, you know, accounting firms are always looking at what entry level associates are making. So this is the uh, local government equivalent of that. The last time we did this was 2002. Um, so the system has become, our pay grade system has become a little bit out of whack. And the recommendation is when you do one, you actually follow it up every five years. The idea being that it lists out, here's where positions should be, here's what their pay rates should be. And then it doesn't mean anyone gets a raise. It doesn't mean anyone loses money. But over time, you've been working to make sure that you have internal equity with your positions and that you have your comparable uh, pay for market positions. What we'd like to do is start it again and then actually follow it up every five years to make sure that we can um, go ahead and uh, just keep our positions competitive, keep the market rate. And also we have a new obligation under the state's MEPA or Mass Equal Pay Act law that we have to make sure that positions are paying the same um, dollar amount for work done by males and females. Um, we've got a question here. So question in the chat. Uh, okay, Ann Haley has a question. Go right ahead, Ann. Um, you asked your question to me directly, so you may want to ask it to the whole... Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry, Tony. Um, okay. I just wanted to get that in there. But um, I have a couple of things. Uh, when we did the classification the last time, which is way too long yep. uh, ago, um, we did have a group of people who were involved with this. I know that it was um, the um, HR person. Did we have an HR person back then? I think so. Um, Mr. Carroll, there was somebody from the Finance Commission, somebody from the Selectman's Office, and a couple of other people. Um, I maybe even, yeah, um, I, there were several people involved. Is there any plan on having that uh, type of group uh, meeting with the people that are going to perform this study? So that's not a real common practice. Uh, at the end of the day, a classification and compensation is just a study that you go out through procurement and you hire a firm to take a look at and then through the personnel board and then moving up through uh, appropriations at town meeting we would make any changes there so remember that a study doesn't necessarily determine or dictate that we will do anything we just need to look at it and have our ideas of where we want to move towards and one follow-up is sure. um now are we doing both um 
uh, pay and uh, other forms of compensation, I benefits, et cetera? So in the municipal world, those are generally all um, much, much more simple or much more similar. So the pension system, for instance, in municipal government in Massachusetts is virtually the same in every city and town. So um, my, even though Norwood has its own retirement board or its own retirement system, my pension is no different than any town manager in the Commonwealth. A DPW worker in Norwood has the same exact pension system uh, that any DPW, direct, uh, any DPW employee in the Commonwealth has. On the health insurance side, we always look at it, but at the end of the day, there's really two variables there. There's only about a half a dozen major health insurers that apply for municipal and state government in Massachusetts. And then it comes down to your split, which is always within a variable of 10 or 15%. So we don't need a, a study to look at those items that we can, you know, the HR department can peg that in, in that inside days, because there's just days off rolling over day, how many days they can roll over. Um, We're really looking at the wage rates as opposed to things like, you know, sick time buyout and vacation time, because again, those end up being fairly standard across the industry. It's, it's the wages that change over time. But I can tell you that vacation time across most cities and towns in Massachusetts is pretty much the same. We might be a little bit more aggressive on one end and a little bit less aggressive on another end. Um, uh, I did get a comment from somebody. If everyone could mute unless they're speaking, just we, we're hearing a little bit of feedback. Um, and then, Jerry, I'll get to your question in just a minute. So uh, take sick time buyback, for instance. You know, every town has a slightly different policy. Ours is actually pretty aggressive compared to most other cities and towns. Um, there are still a lot of organizations out there that pay 100% of somebody's sick time when they retire, when they leave. Ours is um, dramatically reduced from that. We still have some employees who uh, end up with quite a bit of sick time, um, but our calculation is much less than that. So it's really looking at the wage rates and whether the jobs match the job descriptions and whether they match the market rate. Because again, we do have, beyond the fact that we haven't done it in 20 years and it's time to take a look at it, it's creating some imbalances in our pay scale. Uh, we also have to look out for that MEPA issue. So some of those other smaller benefit items end up not being uh, usually HR departments do those. Most of that is available actually through the Mass uh, Personnel Association. Thank you. I, I do support this, um, but I, I do think that we should have included other things in there besides just compensation. Uh, yeah, th those are things wages. that we can look at easily and not have to pay uh, an outside consultant to come in and look at. Okay. I'll look forward to it. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Jerry Slater had a question. Jerry, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, and um, we will be more than happy to try to answer your question. Yep. Um, we'll, uh, all right. Well, Jerry, anytime you can, uh, Question and a comment. Yeah, anytime, Jerry, just jump in. I'll go ahead and get to the next. Uh, okay, now, Tony, I'm there. Go yeah. Ahead. Um, I just want to mention also that um, we were still hearing, I think somebody finally just muted. We were hearing some heavy breathing. So um, thank you to, uh, to folks for checking their mute button. Um, I think you might have answered this. It sounds like there'd be an RFP for this study, um, and that would go out. What do you think the timing would be? So let's assume town meeting approves uh, next week. We would probably want to issue the RFP within 30 days. Um, they'll come back fairly, um, fairly quickly, and then it takes a couple months to get the study. So we'd like something back by this summer. Um, I don't think we would be looking at any changes this fiscal year because we're just too late into the process. And by the time we get it back, we'd probably be at town meeting. Uh, and again, the idea is you're you're getting a framework of where you need to go over a couple of years and then you sort of try to get there over a five-year period and then you do a smaller look after five years and then okay what do we need to adjust and then you go from there so i would assume over the summer is when we'll have final results super thank you yeah uh bob donnelly has a question go right ahead bob hey tony um i should know the answer to this but I was on the first personnel board and I remember at the time, early 2000s, there were actually two classification plans. One was for the light department and the other plan was specific to virtually all the other departments. Does this study combine the classification compensation into one plan or are we still managing with two different plans? Uh, we still have a separate plan for the light department. There's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one of them is that um, statutorily a lot of that that um, relates to the light department's operations are separate. Um, 
Did he click? Uh, oh, they got it. So uh, the light department ends up being a little bit separate. Their study is also a little bit different because they're more comparable to the private sector than what we do internally. So, uh, you know, you take a teacher, for instance, a teacher is easy to compare to another school district because a teacher is a teacher and a, um, let's say an assistant treasurer in a town of a certain size, there's a lot of other easy municipal comparisons out there. The light department has to pay a market rate for its engineers. We actually don't work, we're quite a bit under it. So they'll still sort of have their separate um, pay scale study because they match up directly to munis and they do match up directly to um, the best we can in the private sector, although we generally underpay compared to uh, NGRID and Eversource. Thanks, Tony. Um, just okay. one final comment, and that's um, 20 years is, is an awfully long time to uh, go without, re you know, a new study on classification and compensation. So I, I agree with Ann that this is, uh, this is a, a very good endeavor for the, uh, the town to pursue. Yes, thank you. And, and just one of the points I want to bring up, uh, we are bringing in some of the school administrative positions that we want to make sure across the organization, we try to align those internally. If you're an administrative assistant in the building office versus the administrative assistant for the old ham, there's probably not, there probably shouldn't be much of a pay variation there, but we want to try to bring those in um, comparable positions, uh, similar with things like uh, janitorial staff, where we're taking a look at that. Those positions at the light department, we would pretty much look to, um, keep over and mentions the library, but most of what the light department does, we don't have any sort of an internal comparison, nor do any other cities and towns have electrical engineers um, or, you know, um, the type of broadband engineers that we have. Not too many towns have ca cable guys. <laughs> Thank you. And I, yes, as answered, the library is included. It's all general government as well as the, um, some of the school business positions. But great, great dialogue, great questions. And Dave Tuttle, we did take care of clicking on the got it. My apologies. Uh, does anyone have any other questions on the classification and compensation study? $165,000 out of free cash. I have a question, Tony, and I'm yep. able to load up the chat for some reason. Uh, my question is, uh, have is this done separately for the union staff and the non-union staff? So it, it looks at positions overall and it looks at your administrative positions we always are looking when we're in union negotiations at wages comparable to other similar positions so remember that just having a study doesn't mean we're necessarily going to take action it's more of a goal of where we want to get so i'll give you an example if we look at um a dpw employee their most likely comparison is dpw employees in other towns and then you're going to start breaking it down so your point about the library how do we compare a children's librarian we look at other children's librarians that still has to be bargained so just as if it says that the average children's librarian is paid 10% more in another town, doesn't mean we're going to necessarily raise that uh, position 10% because it might show that maybe we pay 5% more for a circulation librarian or we pay 5% more for an administrative assistant or less. We don't necessarily automatically make that adjustment. It just lets us know where we have to go. And then for bargain positions, we sit down and say, okay, it's apparent to us that these positions are underpaid. We're going to try to get to there over the course of five years. And the idea of that five-year outlook is if somebody's underpaid by 10% according to the market, it's very difficult given everything we're doing to make that full adjustment in a year. So you try to get there over that five-year period, hoping that when you look at it again in five years, are we closer to what we're setting our market to? Thanks. Thank you, John. Further questions on Article 3? All right, jumping right along. Slowly jumping on. Article four is selling a piece of land uh, potentially on uh, Roosevelt Ave. It says selling Roosevelt Ave single family home. We're not actually selling a single family home, but there is a small parcel of land contiguous to a single family home. It's sort of a small triangle shape. Um, it's adjacent to the Callahan. This article would authorize the selectman to sell that piece of land which is effectively part of somebody's yard anyway. It's, um, there used to be a paper street that went in there. It's technically part of that school lot, but there's sort of a tree line that um, defines it. The um, owner has asked about inquiring it. This article would authorize the selectman to sell it. However, it's uh, understanding it's not tax acquired land. So we either have to go out to bid um, or the rate would otherwise be a market rate. So this doesn't by any means guarantee that it's actually gonna sell the property. It just gives the opportunity for them to sell the property um, which would make their lot sort of more contiguous and to avoid the potential of somebody getting a double lot, the selectman would only be selling it with the condition that it not be used for a double lot or to split a lot. 
Um, if you look at the property, it is sort of right at the end of um, that little roundabout by the Callahan um, school. So would make sense to sell it and just sort of round out that lot and hopefully the town gets a little bit of money for it. Uh, at the end of the day, the owner may not like whatever the, um, the assessors and the realtors determine the value of it is. For anyone interested in our 40B land numbers or whether or not our exempt land um, it, we have a certain amount of exempt land. This would not impact that. We're over that by significant um, proportions. I get a question from Alan Slater on Article 4. So, Alan Slater, if you want to go ahead. Uh, thanks, Tony. I mean, you may have uh, answered uh, my question in your uh, description, but and I'm, I'm not opposed to this article, but I guess, you know, who really is going to be interested in this? Uh, I may be other than the next door neighbor. I mean, it's a lot that's too small for a for another housing unit, even if you didn't have the prohibition, you know, it's residentially zoned, so you're not gonna have a commercial, um, you know, establishment there. So the reality is, I guess, is how much interest do you really expect to see in something like this? So gr great question, Alan. The abutting property owner approached the town. So um, that individual, uh, Mr. Shea, is interested in purchasing the piece of land to round out his lot. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't have just identified it and said, let's try to sell this somewhat otherwise useless piece of land that's kind of half of somebody's backyard and a little bit of a paper street. It's not a particularly large slice of land. If he hadn't approached us, we wouldn't have looked to, to sell it. It's um, useless to anyone else. And the selectmen wouldn't sell it to anyone else because it, it'd be like me selling a piece of your backyard. It's sort of like, well, I'm not gonna sell a piece of Alan's backyard to somebody who lives across town. You're just gonna have all sorts of problems there. If this person ended up, uh, Mr. Shea ends up not being interested in the sale price then it's just going to remain town owned land and he um you know won't be able to put a picnic table there or um if he ever goes to sell his house it obviously would add to the value of his house he may not agree to the price okay thank you no problem great question uh other questions on article four all right we'll move right along articles five to seven we're going to take as a group and i'm going to slip ahead to the next slide and i'll talk about these for a minute most people are familiar with the override and our recent override uh, pledge. And as part of that process, because we did go through a tax increase, we committed ourselves to looking at every possible tax exemption that was out there to help lower income seniors, veterans, individuals, anyone who's out there. We've established a volunteer or a donation fund for seniors and for veterans. We have increased the senior tax work off dollar amount. We have increased the eligibility for the senior tax work off. Later in this warrant, there'll be a few other um, uh, tax abatements, but what these would do is it allows, uh, it basically changes the allowable portion of the value that a senior who's otherwise qualifying for a tax exemption can get. So why does it seem so complicated that there's clause 17C and a half, 17D, 17E, for whatever reason, for better or for worse, when the state set a lot of these up, they passed a law saying people with a certain income level and a certain home value can apply for a certain exemption. And then as time went on, instead of tying that to anything or just having those amounts increased, they just added another level of the law and then added another level of the law, um, stipulating their income and their home value. And then 17E allows that to increase with CPI or Consumer uh, Protection Index. So what we're looking to do here is offer the full range of tax abatements available to seniors in the community and veterans as well, as you'll see later. The state pays for some of these portions. We pay for some of it out of our tax overlay, which I'll explain when we get to that article. Um, people can only receive one abatement. You can qualify for as many as you'd like, but you're only allowed to receive one, and it's supposed to be obviously the one that you would receive the most for. You'll see later on that there's disabled veterans uh, tax exemptions. You can, again, qualify for multiple. You only get one, so there's no stacking. Um, and we're just trying to adopt everything that we can possibly do to give every single person in town who may qualify for some kind of an abatement an abatement so it has to be written as three separate articles whereas for whatever reason the veterans articles or the disabled veterans articles don't have to be written separately but i don't you know i don't get to write the state law so um but that will be articles five six and seven now where does this money come from when the town does absorb a cost Every year as part of our budget, we have to put up a certain amount of money that the state determines we have to put up, known as our overlay. And what that basically is, is we base a budget on, we're gonna receive $200 million worth of stuff and we're gonna spend $2 million worth of money. And well, what's our sort of overlay if we have an issue for uh, abatements and we're not taking in as much tax revenue as we anticipated? We put up an overlay. 
these abatements and exemptions come out of that overlay. Just as if you, with your home, were to file an abatement, that money needs to come from somewhere. It comes from our, we call it an overlay account or an overlay line. We more or less determine what the overlay is. Um, the state can tell you to increase it if you have to increase it. It also is just a mechanical tool that allows the town to balance its budget in the spring. Usually if a revenue number change, sorry, in the fall changes, the state will say, well, adjust your overlay. That way you're not having to call a new town meeting to you know, fix a, a half a cent on the tax rate or something like that. So we increased that account uh, about a year and a half ago from a million dollars to a million 40,000 to account for any of these increased exemptions. Again, they're not going to widely apply. There's not hundreds of people out there. There are pretty strict income guidelines, but they're otherwise every possible exemption we can offer to seniors. Um, I'll pause here before I go on to the disabled veterans ones. Any questions on articles five through seven? There's several of these throughout the warrant. I have a question, Tony. Yeah, go right ahead. Um, are, are we using the terms abatement and exemption interchangeably here? I I've uh, understood those to be two separate things. They are. The money comes from the same place. So it, it, it's okay. probably my fault for occasionally referring to it as abatements or exemptions because at the end of the day, we pay for it all out of the same, um, same line of our budget, if you will. Okay. Um, I had noticed that the uh, exemption information for seniors or veterans, those, that paperwork is still not on the town website. Um, the abatement information is, but the exemption information is not. You still have to go into town hall to get those. And so which, um, I'll take a look at that. I'm not sure I'll call Timmy exactly. So you're saying it's the exemption paperwork for seniors? Yeah, you can't get that. It's still not on the website, only the abatement, which is refund if you pay over, right? Uh, yeah, an abatement's usually if you challenge the value of your property. Like an adjustment. Um, <clears throat> the, yeah, I so know the assessor's the office does mail out a lot of those to seniors. They get a yeah. couple calls a week with that, but we'll make sure okay. we get it on the uh, internet as well. Um, and then my other question was: um, Have there been any have there been any thoughts on increasing the max um, maximum income that a senior can have to be eligible for exemptions um, to match the surrounding towns? Because our max income is significantly lower than some of the surrounding towns. Are you talking about for the senior tax work off program? For yeah. For the senior tax workoff program, we can look at that. We just increased it maybe a year ago um, to try to get more people into the program. And it, it, I mean, the program has been challenging the last year because of COVID, but we can always look at increasing it again. But I believe the selectmen did it just maybe six months before COVID began, which feels like 100 years ago. But um, we can always look at increasing it again. Okay. Thank but you. With the understanding that we can always fund that program but it is money that comes out of the budget in a different way. So we always want to balance trying to take care of everyone with the more we shift the burden to everyone else and finding that balance is tough. But I know we did bring up that income level recently quite a bit because it was a little too, um, it was a little too low, but we can always look at it again. Great question. Other questions on articles five through seven? All right, we can always come back to them uh, because article eight, is a much similar um, series of local options that just expand the ability for uh, tax payments for disabled veterans and surviving spouses. So as you read through these clauses, 22F, 20, uh, 22G, and H, these are very narrow categories. But again, our approach was let's take the whole run of every exemption and every abatement we can offer and put them all on there. It may seem like, geez, you know, what are the likelihood that uh, someone will receive the abatement if the property is owned by a trustee or other fiduciary to the person's benefit. If the individual receiving the benefit is domiciled there, so that might be the case if you have a you know a disabled individual who should be receiving it as a result of uh, you know a deceased veteran who was their caretaker. Those are very very minimal um, applications of these, but we wanted to make sure that they were all available so that we can do everything we can do for our veterans. So we've already adopted, have we already adopted 22A through E? Uh, those are part of state law um, in and of themselves. So those are already our current veterans exemptions. These are sort of additional ones that the state wants you to adopt okay. separately. Thank you. Yeah, I know, it, you know what it is, it, it's most of the property tax law dates back a hundred years. And instead of just changing it, they just throw more onto it and throw more onto it and throw more onto it. And the next one is gonna be a great example of that would be, uh, the blind tax abatement. Although they are trying to give cities and towns the um, the choice to do some of these, 
at the end of the day, they should just probably mandate it because none of these are particularly um, budget busters. Uh, other questions on Article 8? All right. Article 9, an additional property tax abatement. So blind residents, folks who are legally blind, currently are allowed a $437.50 uh, abatement. This simply allows that amount to go to the full $500 under state law that is allowed. It's a local option. We have to adopt it. Um, we have exceptionally few of these. So the net cost of the town after the state reimbursement uh, might be $120. But again, we were committed to looking at every possible exemption that was out there that we could offer and trying to offer it to try to help folks as much as possible. So as I said, minimal amount of people, but we are looking to approve the whole slate. Uh, questions on Article 9. All right. Katie, did you still have a question? Oh, all right. No, I'm all set. All right, thank you. Moving on to Article 10, I'll go through the um, several CPA projects we have in brief, and then we'll open those up for questions. We have uh, Travis here from the REC and Patrick from the Planning Department who's coordinated these, and I think there's some CPA committee members here. So uh, the old, par old Parish Cemetery Master Plan, that's a little bit of a tongue twister. Uh, old Parish Cemetery, which is located um, adjacent to the, uh, I'd say it's near the railroad tracks close to Town Hall, is our oldest cemetery in town. The Old Parish Volunteers have done an incredible job restoring the cemetery and working on the cemetery and running programs out of the cemetery. This would simply allow for a master plan or sort of a strategic plan to look at what do we want to do with that site 10 years out, 20 years out. I know there's interest in eventually replacing the fencing and eventually adding some other amenities to it. So a master plan just looks at what are those items that we would like to do over the next you know, five, 10 years and um, cost estimates for some of those items. Uh, the CPA project, the Morse House Feasibility and Study, Feasibility Study and Master Plan. For those of you who aren't familiar, the Morse House is located in South Norwood, uh, right near the middle school. And this would conduct both a feasibility study and a master plan. The feasibility study would look at what the house needs from a structural standpoint, from a, an uh, NMEP standpoint, give us cost estimates of those. Does it need new windows? Does it need new doors? And what would it cost to have them done um, from a historic preservation standpoint, as well as a, um, for the re rehabilitation, as well as sort of a master plan for the property. What, what can we do with it? I mean, right now we sort of use it for some meetings, but this would allow the historic uh, commission and the, um, the town to have an idea of what are we gonna do with the Morse House and what can we do with it? What is it going to cost for any repairs it needs and how do we want to go about approaching them? And again, I'll stop at the end of this whole article. Uh, three of the projects, Murphy Field basketball, basketball Court Rehabilitation, fairly simple. It'll install an ADA accessible path from the lot to the court uh, and we'll also work on um, resurfacing the court. So that one's fairly um, str uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, Sarah, I'll get to your question on the Morse House in one second. Let me just run through these real quick. Uh, CPA project, Town Pool Assessment. This would simply uh, allow the recreation department to have an assessment of the town's two pools. As you know, we operate the pool at Hawes and the pool at Father Max. It will evaluate the condition of both pools, look at cost estimates on potential upgrades, and have some idea of strategically where should we go? Do we continue to maintain two pools? Do we take down one pool? Do we add a pool? All sorts of fun stuff. And then last is the Carillon Rehabilitation. This project was originally, uh, the first portion of this was approved last year. This is an additional uh, funding amend amendment to that project. This takes basically all the bells out of the carillon and refinishes them and reinstalls them. It does need to be done about every 30 or 40 years. It was last done about 37 years ago. Um, so projects like this that are historic restoration but are complicated historic restoration, oftentimes you either need an enormous contingency in the project or you're coming back several times as you go through a project. I would suspect work on the Morse House would be something like that too if it ever came up with, well, it needs new work and it's historic and it's two hundred thousand dollars you can expect to spend much more than that and you're going to look at it in a couple of phases just because historic re um, rehabilitation is much much more complicated um i'll hold here sarah quinn i'll go to you you had a question on the morse house yes i think so I, I should say i think i answered my own question but the morse house always existed in its current location correct and the schoolhouse was moved there i believe that is correct that the schoolhouse the little red brick schoolhouse was moved there and then I guess just in terms of timing, I'm wondering if it would make sense to thinking about holding off on the Morse House feasibility study until we knew what was happening with the Coakley building project, if that would impact at all what the recommendations might be for work at the Morse House and certainly the timing of it. It seems to me it would make sense to plan construction strategically. 
Uh, absolutely. In that sense, it's probably better to get the feasibility study done now and the possibility done now, and that can sort of inform the larger middle school project. Um, construction of the middle school being two years away, three years away. Um, one, we want to know what work does the Morris House need? You know, are we looking at, oh, you know, just need some of the cosmetic work. Is it $50,000 worth of work? Is it $100,000 worth of work? Does the Morris House need $600,000 worth of work? I don't think that's possible. But once we know the full condition and we know what it needs, and then we have an idea of where we want to go, that can sort of inform uh, the middle school project because by the time we're at sort of those construction and placing discussions, we'd be probably 18 months out, a year out. Um, so it's, it's a valid point, but I think we also, knowing more about the Morris House and what its needs are and what its possibility is, I think would help us make any decisions when the middle school planning uh, gets to that phase. I mean, we've selected the current Coakley site. Right. Where we're going to site the new middle school. We're not yet at the point, and we, I don't think the school committee is deciding until June or July on whether it's going to be a six through eight or a five through eight. So that'll sort of inform what the building's going to look like. So this, in theory, the feasibility study uh, and the master plan would be done well before they, we even really look at a schematic design of the building. I guess I was just thinking if there'd be any consideration to moving the Morse house and the Little Red Schoolhouse someplace else on that site if we were orienting the school in a different way or utilizing that property in a different way. Yeah, I think that, that's definitely a possibility. That would probably have to come up as part of sort of the middle school planning once they, they you know, engineers or civil engineers are better at this than I am, but once they sort of put where it can go, and where it can look to go, that's when you would look and say, okay, well, what are some of the challenges? Well, we can't have this here. We want to move this here. I think it's, um, it's definitely going to be looked at in the context of the middle school project. Great. Thank you. Absolutely. Questions on these uh, CPA projects? Uh, Ed Ferris, go right ahead. Actually, a follow up to, uh, to Sarah's question because I was thinking about it and she brings up a very good point. Um, if we start looking at the Morris House right now and we start looking at something that is um, transitory structural, things like um, the roofing system, the plumbing system, uh, things that are top bottom that hit uh, the exterior of the building that can be affected if a move is decided. Uh, I don't know how we'd look at that because if the middle school is two years down the line, you know, and we'll be looking at building construction there and we're looking at adjustments to the lot, and the Morse House obviously is at the beginning of the lot, it also can be a common interest way, and the schoolhouse where they exist. Um, if we spend any money on it based on the study, then we're kind of throwing that money away if, in fact, we do have to move them, you know, especially if you're talking about plumbing, because um, that could get extremely expensive. Absolutely. And in, in some of the ADA requirements, if we were to try to, um, it, it may not be possible to make the Morse House completely ADA compliant, um, certainly not the second floor. But what the feasibility, what that feasibility study will do is tell us what, what are we looking at here? Is the I mean, most of the systems in that building are in good shape. Maybe we want it to be in better shape. I agree with you. We wouldn't want to spend a lot of money and then find out like, okay, well now we've got to move it or now it's going to lose part of the building or there's going to go a road next to it. So I think when when we get the feasibility study back, assuming we go in that direction, that'll let us know, all right, what are we looking at for work here? And then part of that master plan study will tell us, well, what are we going to use it for? And we can, you know, we can certainly ask them to loop that in with the middle school project but it's sort of let's look at what we can do with the morse house what it needs and then we have that and then the selectman can sort of make a decision going from there that okay you know this is really important or this is not important or to your point gee it needs four hundred thousand dollars worth of work do we wait on doing that work there's no immediate need that we've identified so there's also not an immediate need to start spending a lot of money on um the morse house so we have that time this is more about gathering as much information as we can okay uh, and uh, question, oops, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, the only follow up to that would be is, you know, because both that and the schoolhouse are historical um, properties, I mean, right now the schools don't take advantage of them at all. The only thing I would say is if we are going to spend any money on that, let's try and involve, you know, whatever we're doing with that with the school system, because frankly, the middle school is where they start talking about American history. Mm -hmm. And it's a perfect opportunity to leverage those buildings for the school, seeing as how they're right on the property. Absolutely. I think there's, there's a potential for a lot of uh, tie-ins. I've always thought that, you know, the middle, the existing building is going to go, but a, a more proper path from the back of the building to the middle school would make it a lot easier for parking and other things at the Morris House. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of opportunity there. 
Uh, I'll start with Jerry Slater. I have a question from Jerry. Actually, Tony, I, I, I have a question on a different project, and I suspect that Patty and Tony may have comments on the Morse house. So sure, um, why don't you come back, come back to me? I, I appreciate your, um, your being the, uh, the good individual that you are in doing that. Uh, Tony Esco, if you want to go ahead and uh, unmute, you can go ahead and make... Um... Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd just like to make a comment since I am the historical representative on the Community Preservation Committee as a member of the Historic Commission. And I just want to add that absolutely we would love to incorporate more education with them, especially the middle school with the adjacent Morse House. But we really need to make sure that everything is safe within that building. Right now, actually, the town owns it and really suffers, especially with the COVID pandemic from you know, benign neglect. It was so Judith Howard and I, we really tried to clean the inside and make it safe while it's in this uh, downside of COVID without being used very much and made sure there was no food or anything like that in the pantry closets and all that. But um, the, the Morse House, uh, we had had a PowerPoint presentation on this and it's, it's a little frustrating because everything is so remote here with the pandemic, but um, I don't know how many town meeting members were able to see the PowerPoint presentation on the Morris House at the Community Preservation Public Hearing, as well as it rebroadcasted through NOAA Community Media, which I appreciate so much and it's so valuable during these periods of time where we can't meet in person. But the Morris House represents a, um, a physical manifestation of all of Norwood's history, with George Henry Morris being one of the first publicly elected selectmen in the town of Norwood. He was also a fire chief and assessor. He was a civic leader from day one, and it was his choice to build his house even before Norwood was incorporated. He started building that house even before, he, but he knew, he knew it was on the, on the cuffs that Norwood was going to be born. And he is a, in a, a family line of ancestors uh, 10th generation of Samuel Morse, who is one of the original uh, members, men of the Dedham Compact and the founders of Dedham, um, and a direct descendant. There's, there's too much to say about how specifically historic this family is to this house and to the site. The town of Norwood also, uh, often talks about Ezra Morris, and he was one of our first uh, leaders in industry in Norwood, and he uh, he is a, an ancestor of George Henry Morse, and they were all such civic leaders. There is so much that could be brought to students educationally, but the house ne does need more support. In terms of ADA compliance and such, um, that's something that would be have to be looked at. Certainly the first floor would be accessible. The second floor, if it's not feasible, because it sort of has some multi-levels, it's kind of funny up there because it's old, um, there are ways to get around that with if you have enough virtual virtual access. If you had a really great, say, interactive video of the second floor that you can show downstairs on a TV, you've got to get exemptions from that, but it, it can be done. Um, but the, the house has a lot to offer, and many, many organizations were using the house before it was ab abruptly co uh, closed. There's, oh. there's just a lot there to, to offer, and I, I would hope that people would... Um, you know, vote to keep the master plan on. It, it's, it's very, very necessary. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you for that. Uh, Patty Bailey, you're up next. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> if I could just piggyback on some of Tony's comments, um, the reason why so many of us gathered together years and years ago to try to restore that house, and our goal was to make it... Uh, a sort of a museum, a meeting house in an education center for the town. And if uh, whatever plans come forward for a new middle school, I think uh, it that those two buildings, both the Little Red Schoolhouse, which Judith Howard did an amazing job fundraising for that, that and, and getting that relocated to the Moss property, I think that, um, the plans just need to work around those two buildings, is my feeling, and I definitely support a feasibility study because um, I just think this is an integral part of the history and being on adjacent to a school property is, is just perfect. And I know that the Rotary Club has 
donated uh, a significant amount of money to, to even provide a classroom space on the second floor for the students. So, and we have a lot of um, artifacts that um, Ed Canolik has uh, put together displays. We have um, items from the former St. George Roman Catholic Church from South Norwood there. So um, it, it, it's, it's a multi-purpose building and I, I just wanted to um, enlighten anyone that wasn't aware of that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Jerry Slater, you are up next on any project you would like. Thank you, Tony. Um, and, and that was a great, great uh, discussion on uh, on the Morse house for sure. Um, I'd like to move to the pool, if if I might. Absolutely. Um, and um, two questions. One is just a general question on CPA: um, how much we have in there right now, and um, do we is there a requirement that we actually spend a portion of it um, this year? And then my second question. Is a follow-up specifically about the pools, but if um, you can give me an answer on the first one, then we'll move to the second. How's that? So the first question, I'll um, see if Patrick can pull up the chart showing where we are with CPA money. If he's not able to, I can tell you, um, we there's never a requirement to spend your CPA money. You have to sort of allocate 10% of it into each of your categories, but if we wanted to go a couple of years without spending CPA money, we certainly could. Um, Patrick, do you happen to have the CPA um, Fund balances available. If we're not able to, we can get them on the website. E blast them out to everyone and have it for town meeting. Yeah, I'm just uh, I'm just pulling up the um. I have a PowerPoint available, but I can just bring up the slide in one moment. All right. Give us just a minute, folks, and we will have that up. Uh, while we're waiting for Patrick uh, and Haley, is your question uh, quick enough on the more cells and the bells? Tony, this is uh, Tom McQuaid. I, I have the balances. Oh, all right, great. Oh, that works. Uh, if you, either you can give the screen to me or I can just tell you that uh, the balance in the open space and recreation fund before this town meeting is $111,390. And they're proposing to use 57025. So there'd be 54,365 left. In historic preservation, there's a beginning balance of 148, 171, of which they're planning on using 105,000 at this town meeting, leaving 43,171. Community housing has 269,355. Uh, and there's no no use of those funds at this meeting. And then the budgeted reserve ha has a beginning balance of 511,157. And they're proposing to use 213,000, which will leave 298,000. So prior to town meeting, there's a million forty thousand oh seventy three. And after town meeting, if everything's approved, there'll be 665. 048 in total. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that, that's very helpful. Okay, um, Gary, the floor is still yours. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, on the town pool assessment. Oh, um, I just I, want to say I, I did post those on the town website tonight on the town meeting. Great. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Um, back to the, to the town pool assessment. Mm -hmm. um, I am wondering if any part of this is, looks like it's dealing with the outdoor pools. Is there any thought or is the opportunity, is there an opportunity to add um, an assessment of um, the possibility of an indoor pool? So I don't think that's within the context of this particular article. That being said, if, we, uh, if you want my honest opinion about an indoor pool, at some point we as a community need to look at whether we want to continue with the civic as our recreation facility and i'm talking 10 or 15 years down the road um travis and his team do great there there's a lot of fond memories there it's a hundred year old building that we turned into a recreation facility um and it, it functions well but at some point if we were to look at a new recreation facility i think you need to tie that into the senior center and that's where you need to tie an indoor pool in 
The reason being that um, indoor pools beyond the construction cost are very expensive to maintain. So to recover some of that cost, you want to be able to use them as much as you can. And you need some sort of building oversight. If you did sort of a standalone indoor pool, I mean, you need to have people there constantly monitoring it. And I'm not talking just about the lifeguards. You need to have sort of administrative staff. You'd be heating the building. I mean, they're, they're immensely expensive. But when you tie it into a very active recreation facility, and then maybe if you tie that in with a senior center, you've got enough um, people using a pool that it can generate a little bit of revenue and that it gets enough use for its cost. Um, every town does it a little bit differently. I, I grew up in Randolph. They had an indoor pool attached to the high school, which the schools always complained about that their budget had to pay for this pool that didn't get a whole lot of use. So I think in the context of looking at an indoor pool, you've got to sort of identify a facility and identify enough of a use. I think, and I could be wrong, but construction of pools in schools is, you know, it can still happen. The challenge becomes you're now asking a lot of members of the public to go into a school building and school security has changed. So um, the short answer to your question is, I don't think it's really within the scope of this. This is just really to decide that we've got a new, you know, we've got a new bathhouse at um, Haas, but the pool at Haas needs a lot of work. Do we put a lot of work into it or do we sort of dig it out and re-expand it? Father Max has a, um, obviously a much older bathhouse that needs some work. I don't know if we want to spend a million dollars on a new bathhouse there, but can we build something there that extends, um, you know, has outdoor bathrooms that people can use in the pool itself at Father Max is in better shape than the pool at Haas. So this is sort of trying to tie that together and look at what are we doing? Do we keep going with two outdoor pools? Do we go down to one? Um, and in terms of an indoor pool down the road, I would love to have an indoor pool. We just may be quite a while away from that given the overall cost and we'd have to find a, find a building to attach it to. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, I believe next up, um, and I got a few people in line here, but uh, this is great. Anne Haley, did you have a question? Mm, all right, maybe not. Um, Peter McFarland, just a comment that CPA has not spent any money on community housing to date. That is true. Um, communities sometimes struggle to get that up and running. Um, if we were to have an affordable housing trust or we do need to look at in the next couple of years, there are a couple of affordability uh, certificates or, or uh, liens that are expiring on certain properties. There's maybe a handful of them. We may need to look at repurchasing um, those to maintain those affordability numbers. Uh, but very good point, Peter. And thank you for all you do on the Sustainability Commission, Peter. I know that's been hard getting that up and running. Uh, John Hall, if you want to unmute, I believe you are up next. Uh, thank you, Tony. <clears throat> a couple of uh, points on uh, CPA and also on the uh, Morse House proposal and the like. Um, the CPA is written to emphasize three traditionally underfunded and neglected areas. One is historic preservation. One is affordable housing, community housing. And the third is open space. Uh, under the rules, outdoor recreation is included as an extension of open space. And as in many towns in our town, almost all the projects that have come in under the open space umbrella have come in as outdoor recreation pro programs. We are not allowed under the rules to entertain any discussion of something inside a structure. So an indoor pool simply couldn't qualify for CPA. It could qualify under other uh, budgets, but that would run into the points that Tony was making earlier. Um, but the historic preservation is, uh, is challenging because um, the decisions on the spaces in which historic buildings exist tend to be made by groups that do not include any people with historic preservation concerns. And so those concerns tend to be raised late in the process. They're catch up, they're attempts to deflect something that already has a lot of momentum going in a different direction. And I think that's unfortunate. Uh, this is an opportunity. It sounds like, for example, that the process of selecting where the new middle school would go uh, at no point considered the historic buildings there as something they would need to or want to work around, but rather as things that through historical happenstance happen to be in those locations and you could make your plans for the future without any particular concern over that. Um, I would like to suggest that apart from the particulars of these individual projects and decisions, 
it would be a good thing if the town got historic preservation people involved early in any project discussion that is going to have a possible major impact on historic buildings in the town. Yeah, John, just to be clear, um, that was part of the site selection process. Remember, when you're building a new school or a new building of that size, the first process is, again, identifying a site. So you need a certain acreage of land. That's sort of where you start here and you say, okay, this amount of land works. We wouldn't be able to exclude it just because it happens to be adjacent to a historic property. As it gets further in the development process, that's certainly going to be part of it. But we certainly couldn't exclude the existing site saying, well, the middle school is adjacent to a historic property. Therefore, we can never actually rebuild anything on that site. Otherwise, we'd never be able to build anything uh, anywhere. So right now, what we've done the site selection and said we need a certain amount of space for a middle school. Well, where do we have that available space? The best lot came down to where we currently have the middle school. Same too when we did the high school. Same, unfortunately, when we did the DPW. And there's a long history of that uh, project as well, is that sometimes it's tough to find the space. And usually for a school in a town that's fully built out, you're just kind of swapping around your existing spaces. Oh, just to be completely clear here, I was not proposing that this would be, that the historic building presence would be considered an, a disqualifying condition right from the get-go. It's irrelevant. It's an important condition, and it should exist as a flag on any property where it's an issue right from the start. And people keep being reminded that this is going to have consequences that perhaps some other sites would not have. Absolutely. That's a very valid point. And we know that the, the engineering firm, the architectural firm we have on board are going to take that all into consideration as they look at where to site the building on the, uh, the property. Uh, great, great comments. Great questions and discussions. Uh, further questions. Sarah, did you have a question? I just, before this goes any further, I want to make it clear that I am not disputing the educational or historical value of the Morse House. Sure. I'm more thinking that it should be on our radar from the beginning particularly if construction is happening close to the Morse house. And then again, if usage is flipped as it was at the high school and the sports fields are on that side of the building, I think that we should be mindful of what we need to do to take care of that building. Um, and I just wasn't sure if it was important to spend the money now or if it made sense to wait until we had more details. Thank you. Absolutely. Very valid point. Absolutely going to be looked at. And again, the feasibility study and master plan is sort of that first step in saying, what, what do we need at the Morris House? What can we really do here? And that'll inform everything else we do, especially with the middle school planning. Questions on Article 10. All right, we're going to move on to some of the zoning articles. Um, Paul Helkiotis, if you want to unmute, um, I can give a brief overview of these and then you are certainly our uh, resident expert on zoning as our town planner. Um, so, uh, Paul, do you want to give the overview for Article 11 or would you like me to do it? Um, I can do it. And if you, um, Joe, let me share the screen. I'll, I'll run through a presentation. Good evening. All right. Good evening. Give us one minute. We're going to make you a host. And then you should be able to share your screen any minute now. I can stop sharing my screen for that to be able to happen, but. All right, good evening. Um, we have uh, six zoning amendments that we are um, going to present at town meeting. And we've been waiting a while to do this. As you know, this was uh, scheduled for the annual town meeting uh, in May, and then it was scheduled for November 11th. And um, that was postponed again. So. We are ready to go and eager to uh, move forward with our zoning amendments, some, some of which, including this particular article in our new zoning map, um, we have been working on for a few years with the engineering department and a consultant called uh, CAI. We are, uh, this article will ad ad adopt a new official town zoning map. This will be a next generation map. It's a digital computer-based map, it's color. And uh, the base layer of the map are the town's property boundaries. And that's important for uh, using the map in the future to identify what zoning districts each different property is located in. This is our current zoning map. We've had it for a long time. It's black and white, it's pen and ink. Um, it's not digital and the property boundaries are not there. And so 
when somebody calls and says, what zoning district are we in? It can take me 15 or 20 minutes to figure that out because there are no lot lines there to help uh, identify what zone that property is in. Uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, many communities have updated their zoning maps um, to do this kind of new geographic information based map. Um, because this is a digital map that will be part of our geographic information system, it will enable us to uh, put other layers onto the map to see different things. And it will allow us to connect data to the map itself. And when I say data, I mean like the town assessor's data for each individual property. You can click on it and access information on that property. That's just one example of how the data and, and the, the geographic maps can be linked together. We can put layers on this map um, to look at things like the FEMA flood zone boundaries. We can put a building layer on to show the building's location within uh, those property boundaries, uh, layers that show wetlands and waterways. This is a look at our, our proposed new zoning map as you can see, it uh, looks a lot nicer. It's very colorful. Um, it shows overlay district and, and regular uh, zoning district boundaries. And um, if you look really close, it's hard um, at, at this scale, but you can see the individual property lines. This will be a valuable tool for appraisers, engineers, surveyors, the town residents, and the town employees, the engineering, planning staff, um, the assessor, um, to be able to um, access zoning information and use it to look at other things um, much quicker and easier than we have been able to in the past. The planning board and the board of selectmen um, both recommend approval of this article. I'd be glad to answer any questions. All right, that's good. We are gonna- Actually, go <laughs> sorry, I put it in the uh, comment, but I didn't know if you saw that or not. I'm sorry, go ahead. And and actually, John Hall um, wanted to make a comment before me. John, good evening. Uh, no, sorry, that, uh, John's comment was uh, related to the last one. Sorry, I had walked away from my computer to grab an ice cream, everyone. Oh, I have a comment on this, too. <laughs> oh, all right, we'll, we'll do yeah, it first. That's what I thought, then, John. I think Ed came in first. So. I did, but you texted first. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll leave the floor to you so you can start. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to be quick. Uh, Paul, this looks like a wonderful innovation, and I'm wondering uh, if it might be useful for decisions regarding road streets and other uh, things. Would it, can it be coded in terms of location, width, condition, and uh, need for repair and that sort of thing? Because it seems like it could be very helpful to Mark Ryan if it could. That's an excellent question, John, and um, you've really kind of um, honed in on one of the great features of these types of maps. So um, it, through, uh, through aerial photography and, and actual mapping of what's on the ground, um, individual telephone poles, fire hydrants, um, manhole covers can be identified on the maps, including things like water lines and sewer lines. And um, public works departments use geographic information systems to help manage infrastructure. So if, um, if the DPW goes in and they, they change um, uh, and install new water mains in a neighborhood, those can all be um, identified, um, that line segment showing where the water main is. Um, you can point to that and you know, that's an eight inch water main. Um, it's it's uh, three years old. Um, and then you can go to another area of the map and identify, um, well, here, here's the next section of town that we want to update the, the uh, water mains. And so this is a tool that is used by public works departments. It's actually used across the board in all municipal departments. Fire departments can um, identify locations where uh, there have been fires. Police department can um, create like pin maps that show where certain types of crimes can have occurred. And it's amazing when you when you map things out and you can see patterns, it really comes to life and enables you to, to use that data more effectively. I've seen cities that have used it to locate which buildings are sprinklered so that you can uh, have an impact on insurance rates for the city and a whole lot of things like that. It's just endless possibilities. Yeah, and, and um, you know, another layer that, that we usually turn on and off is, is the aerial photography layer. 
And so, you know, if I'm looking at a piece of property, um, I can turn on the aerial photos and see exactly what's on the ground, zoom in and out. So this is part of a, it's one layer of a geographic information mapping system that can have an infinite number of layers. It's just data layers that need to be created. And over time, we're gonna be working on creating those layers. The light department already has their own geographic information system. And the things that I just mentioned, they already have all mapped. And so they're one step ahead of us. This is something that many towns have had um, for years, and we're now um, catching up to this next generation of information management. Ed? Yeah, so that's what I was gonna ask, because um, I know the light department has had their own mapping software for a while. I was gonna say, are you working with them using a similar product or what kind of product are you using now? Or have you been planning on using? Because it says you've been talking to consultancy about this. Um, yeah, the light department um, kind of has their own, their own program and their own system. The mapping system that we've purchased is kind of the gold standard. It's um, um, Esri uh, Arc Info mapping system. And we, we've got two different kind of versions of it. There's, uh, there's like the pro version that um, guys like Pat DeShane can use to make fancy maps. And then there is um, like the public facing version, which is what we currently have on our, uh, up on our town website now. We were um, going to do a, uh, a program at the library to, to show off our new GIS and how, how it was gonna work um, last fall. And we ended up kind of getting sidetracked and then the pandemic happened, but we will um, get together at the library and offer um, some programs for the residents to be able to see how they can go on to the town's website and utilize that GIS that's available to them. Just, uh, I'll jump in real quick. At the, um about three years ago, we got around um, uh, $60,000 in a state grant to actually build out our GIS system, our GIS map, because we were a little bit behind the times on it. So this is sort of that natural progression of we're finally kind of getting into that late 20th century um, mapping of uh, with GIS. The light department system is separate because it's connected to their outage management, outage management system. And there's some federal and state regulations, but we can't share that system because it's tied into the outage management system. And Indirectly, it's tied into the grid. It's really not, but it's just a, it's a quirk with light companies and the data that we're allowed to share, even with ourselves. Yeah, no, I understand that. Um, it's just that the base layers for those systems can be interchangeable. So yeah. you can share them amongst each other so you can get a generalized overall map that you can pull anything on. But the follow-up to that and the reason I was asking about the software was, you know, what we have on the website is very, very limited and it would be ideal if this had a presentation layer that could be available on the website with the same kind of functionality you would see. And I know uh, ArcGIS, if that's the product you're talking about. Yes. Um, ArcGIS has a great presentation layer that allows you to post um, the interactive map capability right into a web portal. Uh, and as the question becomes then, well, that's fantastic as long as we have it. Number one, will we get it? And number two, will we use it? So, so yes, we do have um, ArcGIS, and as I said, we've got we've got two different versions of it. Um, many communities have a, uh, a GIS staff person that provides staff support to engineering and planning, producing different maps and studies. Um, we are in the early stages of developing our GIS, and the, the DPW is. Um, has been in the process for years now to develop data layers for like, you know, pavement management, um, the water system and so forth. So we're, we're in the early stages. As Tony mentioned, we were able to get a grant to help us finish off the development of it. And we really just have had it for about a year now. And so we're, uh, we're just starting to get our legs with it. And um, we will, uh, as, as these things become available, make them more available to the public um, but we're still in the process of, of uh, learning how to use uh, the system ourselves. All right. Any other questions on the digital zoning map? All right. Article Thanks. 12. Thanks, Tony. Um, the, the map that you can see now does actually, it's, part, it's our new zoning map, and you can actually see the, uh, the, the building layers on it. Those little dots are where there are homes and buildings. Um, this is our big article for uh, town meeting this year, 
And um, this is a study that we started about a year and a half ago. We received a grant for $36,000 and we used that money to retain the services of a, uh, a consultant, Ted Brovitz, to work with us to undertake a study of the Route 1 corridor. Um, I'm going to stop for one moment before I, I drill into the presentation and explain that uh, at the end of last year, the legislature approved the Economic Development Bond Bill. And embedded within that Economic Development Bond Bill were um, some changes to the State Zoning Act and the creation of a new um, Housing Choice Program. You may have seen some discussion um, in, the, in the local paper uh, at a planning board meeting about some of what we were un beginning to, to learn about the new law. Um, but last week, we discovered that there were sections of the new law which amends Chapter 48, the State Zoning Act, and some of those amendments went into effective immediately upon the signature of the governor. This was very rare for zoning. Um, usually when laws go into effect immediately, they involve public health and safety, um, in the 35 years I've been doing this in Massachusetts, um, I've never seen any zoning related or planning related laws go into effect immediately. So this kind of sent us uh, scrambling to understand what sections of the law went into effect immediately and, and have those changes, um, are they going to have any kind of impact on our town meeting? So we, uh, we consulted with David DeLuca, town council. And um, we began to understand that uh, there are sections in this law that say that any zoning amendments that involve affordable housing, mixed use housing, or um, uh, I'm blanking on the third one, uh, uh, accessory apartments, that uh, any zoning amendments like that would uh, change the requirement for the needed number of votes to be approved. So um, mixed use and affordable housing and multifamily housing are all built into Article 12 um, for Route 1. And um, what we uh, now know is that there are sections of this article that are gonna need to be uh, voted on separately that will require just a simple majority vote. So those parts of this zoning amendment that affect multifamily, affordable or mixed use will require just a simple majority vote. But the other sections of these zoning changes for things like signs just require the two thirds vote that has been the norm for the last um, you know, 50 years in Massachusetts. So as a result, Article 12 will be complicated because within this one article, there are gonna need to be five separate motions in order to comply with these recent changes to the State Zoning Act. We began the Route 1 corridor study by identifying problems that we thought we should try to address and, and, and manage and fix in the future. One of the basic problems with Route 1 is along the four miles stretch of Route 1, we have four different zoning districts, the highway business zone, manufacturing, limited manufacturing, and general residence. Each of these four zoning districts has different zoning regulations that affect the frontage, minimum lot size, setbacks, and building heights. Other problems that we identified along the Route 1 corridor are large signs. Some are, are, are big billboards, message board signs, the uh, Newbury Comics sign is uh, a, a, a huge tall sign like the kind you'd see on, on the side of an interstate highway um, and out of, out of scale, frankly, with the other signs along the road. Sections of Route 1 don't have any sidewalks, so there's poor pedestrian access. There's encroachment into the state road. We have um, some car dealers selling cars from the state layout. We have parking spaces along Route 1 that, that extended to the state road. Um, cars waiting to be repaired and other businesses on the state road. And that was identified as, uh, as an issue that we wanted to try to address. Some sections of Route 1 look pretty good. Other sections, not so much. There's a, there's a lack of landscaping along some sections of the road. Other sections, you know, have trees and, and look really nice. 
when we worked with uh, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, our regional planning agency on the municipal vulnerability preparedness project, they identified um, areas of town that have the urban heat sink effect. And um, along Route 1, that corridor, all the pavement and those parking lots were identified as one of the town's hotspots. This article will amend several different sections of the zoning bylaw. And these sections include section 2.1, the establishment of districts, section 2.3, the zoning map, section three, the use regulations, section four, uh, 3.15, the table of use regulations, section 3.16, the notes to the table of use regulations, section four, the dimensional requirements, section 4.1.1, the table of dimensional requirements, section 6.1 parking, 6.2 signs, 6.3 buffers, and last, section 6.4, landscaping and screening. Our consultant began the study by um, inventorying the existing conditions. They looked at, the, at what businesses were there, the size of the lots, um, the characteristics of, of uh, the corridor. They looked at market trends and conditions, natural resources, transportation and mobility. Then they looked at the current zoning and looked at all the different zoning requirements within those four different districts along the corridor. From there, um, we worked with the consultants and developed um, a, a vision for what we wanted to see along uh, Route 1 in the future, what kind of things we wanted to have changed. And from that, it led to um, developing some zoning amendments. The, uh, the study was topical in some areas, looking uh, at uh, mobility, conservation and recreation, land use and zoning. Consultants even made some recommendations to, uh, to change and expand how uh, Route 1 is branded. As you all know, uh, back in the 60s and 70s, Ernie Bach Sr. Uh, branded the Auto Mile, uh, and it's, it's known as, as that today. Uh, there are some recommendations to perhaps um, try to revive that and expand upon it to help bring more customers to those businesses along the Auto Mile. So as I mentioned a minute ago, uh, the process that was followed by, by Ted Provitz, our consultant and the subconsultants working with him, look at the existing zoning, develop a vision plan, and then propose a new zoning scheme. One of the key elements to this project was to identify where we would like to allow mixed use development. And by mixed use, uh, what I mean is that there would be commercial on the first floor and it would allow for residential above, condominiums and apartments above um, or behind. And uh, the bylaw requires that the frontage areas along Route 1 be reserved for commercial uses only. We identified three areas that we're recommending to allow mixed use development. Moving north to south, the first one is the University Ave Everett Street area. And the second, is um, land adjacent to the traffic circle on Neponset Street. And the third is uh, an area down near uh, Vanderbilt Business Park. The main uh, recommendation for Article 12 is to uh, eliminate the existing highway business zone. Uh, much of the, the land in this Route 1 corridor is currently currently zoned highway business, HB, but along the corridor, we also have manufacturing and limited ma manufacturing zone land. So some of the M and the LM districts are now being uh, converted to this new Boston Providence Highway District and virtually all of the properties that were currently located in the uh, highway business zone are gonna be converted to the new Boston Providence Highway District. If you look at the uh, the new zoning map now, you can see um, a blue corridor on either side of Route 1. And these are the areas that we're recommending would be part of this new zoning district. There were areas that uh, along Route 1 that, that kind of expanded a little bit beyond the main corridor. And those were our existing business parks, Vanderbilt Park, FM Global uh, Business Park, Norwood Park South. Brookside Park and um, frontage areas along south of Sumner Street. This slide may look familiar to you. The mixed use zoning that was approved for the downtown two years ago 
we, what we're going to do is in the downtown, we created a mixed use overlay zone and we are going to take those, uh, the regulations from those mixed use overlay districts in section 9.4, and we're gonna allow mixed use zoning in those areas that I just mentioned, um, but they'll follow the same kind of regulations that we have for the downtown. And, and the image of, of buildings here show uh, along Route 1, uh, a mixed use building that would have commercial on the first floor, and then perhaps the second and third stories above could be residential. Uh, and, and that's just an option that a, a property owner has. They don't have to uh, develop mixed use development on these properties, but it is an option that's available to them if they would like to do that. Again, here we, uh, we zoom in on th these areas that would be allowed for mixed use uh, from left to right, the uh, Everett Street University Ave area, the area on the Ponson Street and the traffic circle and uh, along Vanderbilt Business Park. The mixed use zoning district um, uh, has the standards that we utilize from the downtown. It uses a, a different gross floor area um, uh, approach to uh, regulating the density. The other piece of uh, this project was to um, take a look at all of the towns, um, all of the use regulations within this corridor. So we took a look at all of the different uses and we made some adjustments to the uses that would be allowed by right, allowed by special permit, prohibited or prohibited or, uh, or prohibited uses. The special permit granting authority um, is going to be the planning board for this four mile corridor. And um, this slide shows a, a portion of those table of use regulations and shows some of the different changes that are being made as part of this zoning amendment. The other area that will be changed as part of the zoning amendment are changes to the dimensional requirements. Um, this will, uh, these new standards will provide more flexibility for small businesses parking placement circulation, building height and setback. It'll encourage uh, shared access so that if uh, two abutting businesses wanna have a connection within their parking lots so that people that are um, shopping don't have to jump back out onto Route 1 just to go to the neighboring property, that'll help um, traffic circulation and public safety. And the other um, key piece to uh, these regulations is trying to uh, improve the streetscape. This slide um, shows what we currently have in the highway business district. On the left, we see um, the minimum frontage is 150 feet currently in the HB district. Uh, the front setback is 50 feet, 15 foot side setbacks and 30 foot setback to the rear. Eliminating the highway business district under the new Boston Providence Highway District, the, uh, the dimensional requirements will change slightly. It'll allow for uh, less frontage, 100 feet, less uh, uh, setback, 20 feet, uh, 10 foot side setbacks and a 20 foot rear setback. Within that 20 foot rear setback, however, there are new buffering requirements, particularly in areas where uh, it abuts a residential zoning district. So although we're just decreasing the rear setback from 30 to 20, we're gonna require fences and, um, and landscaping to help provide a buffer. The maximum building height that will be allowed in the Boston Providence Highway District is, uh, is 60 feet. However, similar to the regulations that were approved for the downtown mixed use district, you can't have a 60 foot building right on the curb because we didn't want to have that, that canyon effect downtown. So this slide represents um, the metrics of how, how uh, far you would have to go back to get a 60 foot high building. Within, uh, first there's a 20 foot setback. So it starts on the left where it says ROW, that's the right of way, that's, that's route one. And there's a 20 foot setback. And at that 20 foot setback, um, a building height can only be 20 feet. But as you go back 60 feet, it allows uh, a maximum height of uh, a 60 foot building. And then it tapers off back towards the back of the property line. To give you some kind of uh, point of reference or comparison um, of a 60 foot building, the new um, Avalon apartment buildings are 60 feet. 
the Dedham Medical Building on Route 1 is 70 feet, and the Hampton Inn Building is 66 feet. So for those of you that have concerns that 60 feet is, is high or too high for uh, the Boston Providence Highway, you should bear in mind that we already have, have uh, the Dedham Medical Building in the 70 feet and uh, the Hampton Inn that's 66 feet. So um, those have kind of set a precedent and that'll give you um, a, a good understanding of how tall buildings could be. The other thing about building height that you need to bear in mind here is that the airport is nearby. And um, the development of a building on any particular lot in, in, in this quarter is gonna need to comply with FAA restrictions for the Norwood Airport. The uh, general regulations for the Boston Providence Highway cover um, several different areas. The first that I'm gonna discuss is parking. And this image shows that along the highway, we are gonna require a new green buffer strip that needs to have deciduous shade trees. Within that area, there needs to be a sidewalk. Parking will be um, allowed in front of the buildings, but the majority of the par parking we would like to encourage to be on the side of the rear. Um, this is a, a, a contemporary way of, of laying out a site and, and buildings. And um, we think that by uh, creating these new uh, buffer strip requirements along the road, eventually over time, it'll help green up the road. It'll address that urban heat sink effect. It'll provide pedestrian access so that folks that want to uh, go walk uh, two doors down to get a sandwich for lunch, won't have to be walking on a dirt path on the side of the road. The other section of the general regulations that will be amended in this bylaw will be the sign regulations. As I mentioned earlier, we really have kind of a mishmash of signs, um, a wide variety of types and, and heights and sizes of signs. And we wanna to try to um, create a little more visual continuity for signs. We know signs that are very important to those businesses, um, but we wanna to try to um, rein in the height and the size of those signs. One type of sign that we think is most appropriate for this type of corridor is a monument sign. And we're gonna kind of encourage those. Those are the signs that you see on the ground. They're usually more attractive and surrounded by some landscaping and some uplighting. And we think that's um, the best way for us to try to get um, some different types of signs along the corridor that look more in keeping with the vision that we have for the future. This uh, slide shows um, how far back you would have to go to put up a, uh, a, a sign of 50 square feet. And it shows that if you wanna have um, a 100 square foot sign, which is currently allowed in the bylaw, you have to push that back at least 50 feet. And that, and, and that is a way that we're gonna try to discourage those big signs and encourage more of these, these smaller monument type signs. As I mentioned earlier, we talked a little bit about the five foot sidewalk, the trees and the landscaping within the setbacks. The primary building can be placed um, at, at that 20 foot setback. And this slide shows the, uh, the building envelope. We'll have uh, environmental protection standards that regulate lighting, noise, stormwater management, ocean control, um, pre uh, tree protection, and um, some types of businesses will require special permits that will be um, issued by the planning board. That is pretty much all of um, what we have for the Route 1 presentation. I knew I throw I throw a lot of information at you all at once, and this is complicated because this particular amendment um, affects so many different sections of the zoning bylaw. So at this point, I'd be glad to answer any questions. I think first up, we have Ed Ferris has three questions. Go ahead, Ed. Hey, thank you. Um, so the first is on the uh, mixed use proposal for. Um, the first section you were talking about, which is Everett University, I believe. Yep. So the concern there is that opening up a mixed use section in there will significantly increase the overall amount of traffic in that particular area. And right now we suffer from major traffic setback because we have a huge bottleneck um, being stuck with Route 1, Washington Street, um, and Upland Road, all squeezing together as the only egress points basically 
heading northeast into Boston. And the backups on those roads can travel to, you know, a mile to two miles when we're in non-COVID conditions during the morning and the evening. If you're going to put a mixed-use section up here where you're going to be increasing traffic offset on either Everett University or Route 1 at that point, I mean, you're just compounding that problem. And you're compounding it terribly because there's no place for anybody to go. So I wanted to make that point. I wanted to see, you know, how you've reacted to that or if anybody's thought about it. That was number one. Okay, let, let's start with that one. The, the locations that we were selected were, were selected because there are major crossroads. And that, that means that you don't have to get onto Route 1, um, you know, to leave, leave the, that area. You have the opportunity to use one of the major crossroads um, to get where you need to go um, to spread that traffic out. The, the real estate market has the highest demand right now. The use that is in the highest demand in, in Eastern Massachusetts is housing. We don't need more office parks. We really don't need a lot more retail. And the types of uses that, that really uh, are in demand right now and, and the governor through the implementation of the housing choice law and the changes to chapter 40A has made it clear that, that the state has a housing crisis and they are looking for the communities to, um, uh, to create more housing. And so one of the reasons why we're doing this is to um, not create zones for uses that no one wants to build. We want to create zones for uses that people do want to build to meet that, that market demand. So traffic is inevitable. We understand that. Um, we understand that there's, there's traffic issues now. Um, what the wild card is right now is we don't know what traffic's going to be like in the future after the pandemic subsides. We know that many people are working from home. We know many corporations and businesses are going to be changing their policies by not requiring their employees to report to work every day. And we are cautiously optimistic that in the long run, the kind of traffic that we were dealing with just a year ago um, that was really at a crisis level in, in Eastern Massachusetts, we don't think it's going to return back to those levels um, for a very long time. Um, residential uses um, generate traffic throughout the day. They don't necessarily just generate traffic during, you know, nine to five business hours, like the way businesses do. So we don't think that we're going to have um, too much uh, um, exacerbation of the existing traffic situation along the Route 1 corridor based on the locations that we've selected for the mixed-use districts. Okay. Um, I don't disagree with a lot of what you said. I just disagree with using that particular section as a mixed use. And your argument to say that it's at crossroads, you know, I assume you're talking about University and Everett. Um, yeah. If you look at the traffic on University and Everett, when it was at its high, you would have traffic from one up Everett Street going to the lights on Washington Street and looping back on Washington Street. And the same thing for University Ave when University Ave had construction working on, going on there. And every time, basically, it's had construction work, the traffic is backed up back to Route 1. I don't think that area is viable for any kind of mixed use, even though, yes, residential will have during the day. But I work with a lot of clients, and I'll be very honest. While many clients are looking at downsizing their footprint, you know, for office space, Many more are not. And frankly, unless you are in a information services business, you're going to be going to work every day because you really can't work remotely. That's all I want to say on that regard. So I would honestly ask you to rethink using that one section. Put it somewhere else along the highway, if at all possible. I understand the need for housing. I agree with the need for housing. But that particular area is a terrible point to put it on. So there was, there was um, one, one more point on, on that particular intersection that I didn't mention. Um, that intersection is scheduled to be um, widened. It, it's on the state transportation improvement plan list. 
and there are going to be additional turning lanes created there um, within the next few years. Um, that will help a little bit, but I don't disagree with, with the points you've made. Yeah, I mean, most of the backup that we're seeing right now, frankly, we are still seeing primarily because of what Dedham was allowed to do along the Route 1, Route 128, where they took out the breakdown lane and made that terrible third lane, you know, coming south, which basically is a traffic accident waiting to happen on a regular basis. They did that on 93 North, and it has caused nothing but continuous traffic accidents. So it's a bad design. But, and that's exasperating this problem, and it's out of our control also. Same thing as uh, the Islington traffic lights, which exasperate the traffic problem, and they're effectively out of our control. So um, the other question was um, frontage. Uh, I understand what you were saying about frontage, but I didn't understand how frontage relates to building heights. Because if you're talking about a building that's going to go 60 feet high, but you're only allowing a frontage of 20 feet, um, aren't you effectively making a corridor? The, the a frontage is going to be 100 feet for, for any lot. That's the minimum frontage within this Boston Province Highway District. I think you might have been confusing that with one of the setbacks. Okay. Thank you, then. I appreciate that. Yeah, just quickly um, on that, Ed, um, you, you might have been referring to when we talk about the step back, so that height is 60 feet, but it can't be 60 feet at the road. It can be 60 feet a certain degree back, and you might be able to do a 20-foot sort of picture uh, a hotel, a 20-foot sort of whatever they call those things where the car is pulling under, and then it's 50 feet behind that and then up or above that. Okay, and that was my next question is how is height relative to frontage? So thank you. You answered both of them. That's it. Great. Thank you, Ed. Thanks. Uh, big zoning article. Do we have um, further questions on this zoning? There was one point I wanted to make on the economic need of it. Uh, you can always buzz us or put in the comments. Uh, just one note on the economic need. Um, Route 1 has always been a significant contributor to our tax base. And with residential property values rising at the rate that they are, we're hoping to unlock some of the um, commercial development potential and the development potential in general on um, Route 1 to hopefully try to prevent Route 1 from slipping from 21% of the tax base to 20 to 19 to 18. Because as that happens, and residential values continue to skyrocket, what happens is your residential property taxes go up and the town doesn't generate any additional revenue from that. It's just shifting from the commercial to the residential. So where, where we can unlock that growth helps at least, um, I mean, new growth is always good, but helps try to ease that burden. I believe we did have a comment from Judith Howard. Judith, you want to unmute and go ahead? Judith Howard, the floor is yours. Good evening, Judith. Um, I don't know if Judith is still with us. I'm not seeing her on the screen. Is anyone else? No, well, we can always come back. Looks like she might have dropped. Okay. Uh, further questions on Article 12 uh, before um, uh, Paul moves on with the rest of the zoning one, uh, related articles? All right, Paul, if you just want to continue moving on and Judith comes back, we can always grab her. All right. Um, am I sharing my screen again, Joe? Yep. All right, this is the wrong one. Hold on one second. Okay. Wait for that to save. Trying to close that out. And so there we go. All right, thank you for bearing with me. Article 13 um, will uh, change regulations for 
open lot storage of vehicles. This is a subject matter that town meeting members I know are familiar with um, because we had a moratorium on new open lot storage facilities that expired um, in July. And we were hoping to get the, these regulations in place before it expired, but um, time ran out. Um, so we have a bylaw amendment that will hopefully um, um, provide uh, a balance between what the uh, auto industry needs and trying to rein these things in and regulate them and, and bring them into the Route 1 corridor where they belong. As most of you know, Norwood's home to a large number of auto dealerships on Route 1. The industry has a lot of different requirements that they put on uh, their manufacturing. And um, we have been experiencing um, the, uh, the outcome from these requirements for all the dealerships to have uh, accessory storage lots. And currently, uh, the storage locks are, are part of a broad term open lot storage in our zoning bylaw. And uh, it's the same regulations that would um, cover storing uh, telephone poles as the, the regulations covering um, storing cars. And so uh, we are going to create a new subsection within this area that, that defines open lot vehicle storage and then um, uh, regulates it. Right now, open lot vehicle storage is only allowed in the manufacturing zone. And that's one of our valuable zoning districts. We still have a lot of uh, manufacturing businesses in town that employ a lot of people and they generate a lot of tax revenue. And so uh, what we have been observing is that um, the land in our manufacturing zone, the remaining land is getting gobbled up with these uh, parking lots, these open lot storage. And um, uh, what we found is, is that uh, um, what the way the regulations currently regulate open lot storage is that the lots with fewer than 100 vehicles are approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals, special permits, but those storage lots that have over 100 vehicles are uh, regulated by the planning board through a major project special permit. So you have two different boards that regulate this one use depending on how many cars are being stored. Um, the town of Norwood is, is not a, a big town geographically. We have uh, just over 10 square miles. The manufacturing zone land um, is scattered throughout the town, um, and some of the manufacturing zone is, is surrounded by residential districts, which, which can cause some issues. Uh, the proposed zoning changes uh, consolidate this particular use and, and better define it, and it, it brings these uses back to the Route 1 corridor so that they're not spread out throughout the town, creating um, traffic safety issues. Um, this will protect the town's land resources but still provides a um, place for the auto industry to store uh, the vehicles that they need to. This slide shows the area that we have the, uh, the, where the current uh, auto dealerships are, where the, uh, the storage lots are uh, in the manufacturing zone. The tan color is where the manufacturing zone land is. Um, the blue shows where our current auto dealers are located and the red show where the accessory um, open lot storage lots are. The bylaw will separate um, open lot storage of motor vehicles from these other types of uh, storage uses, consolidate that into uh, the Boston Providence Highway District and the planning board will become the special permit granting authority for uh, all of these open lot storage areas, regardless of how many vehicles will be stored there. Um, it, we also put in a footnote or provision that will prevent Vanderbilt Business Park from becoming one large uh, vehicle storage area. We currently have one there now, and um, the planning board believes that that's enough um, and doesn't want to see that area get um, turned into one big auto storage lot. And so um, we've got something in place that will prevent that from happening. Um, this is the section of the uh, table of use regulations. It shows that under this category of wholesale business and storage, um, down at the bottom, we create this new use, um, open lot storage of motor vehicles. And if you look across the board where the zoning districts are listed, that particular use is now um, prohibited. No is the end there. And that's uh, in all the zoning districts, except for BPH, that new Boston Providence Highway District, if article 12 does get approved, and the footnote helps to protect uh, Vanderbilt Business Park from becoming a big open lot storage area. 
the planning board has worked on this closely um, with, with the selectmen and both boards um, uh, recommend that you support this particular article. That's all I have on this and I would be glad to answer any questions. Questions from anyone on the uh, open lot storage zoning amendment. And again, we can always come back to these. All right, uh, Judith, you've joined us again. Would you like to um, make a comment? Let me see here, we have a new comment coming in. All right, well, we'll continue uh, moving on. Article 14. Judith, um, when you're ready, we'll come back to you. Um, let us know when um, you have your question. So Article 14 um, will change slightly the regulations in the town for drive through windows. That's section 7.3 in the zoning bylaw. Um, right now, uh, drive through windows are allowed in most of the town's commercial zoning districts. However, we discovered that they are not allowed use in the general business district. And we thought that was odd. The general business district is one of our largest commercial zones. And as many of us know, drive throughs are convenient and popular. Sometimes they offer faster service. They're also um, uh, helpful to folks that have mobility issues and seniors folks that don't want to get out of their car in bad weather. And so we want to try to make this particular use allowed in the general business zone. Right now, um, they're allowed by special permit from the planning board in the manufacturing district, the planned mixed use development district, the limited manufacturing district, the highway business district, which will go away if article 12 is approved and the limited manufacturing district. So you can see all these commercial districts, but oddly enough, not in the general business zone. The change to section 7.23 will make it clear that only one drive-through ordering window and one pickup window are allowed per building. There's language um, in, the in this section of the bylaw right now, but after reading it over and over again and the planning board members staring at it and scratching our heads, it wasn't real clear. So one change that we are making will make that point clear. The other thing that um, this will do, it will add a new requirement for the design of drive-through lanes by requiring that there's an escape lane or a bailout lane. This really kind of came up with an application that the planning board had that included a 270 foot long drive-through lane that had no escape lane. So once you got in there to get your cup of coffee and you went around the corner of the building, you had no way out. Um, and so we felt that uh, a better design solution um, that we needed to uh, incorporate into our regulations was to require that there be a way out in case somebody has to get out of that lane once they're in it, if they have to bail out and, and get out of there, um, this new requirement will allow that. This will only affect new drive-through windows. It won't affect um, any existing ones. Those are grandfathered under zoning. The planning board recommends this article and uh, the selectmen support it. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Any questions on the drive-through zoning article? No? All right, we'll keep plugging along. Paul, I think you're still up. Thanks, Tony. Um, so I am now going to take a break because Article 15 is the article for uh, a liquor license for the Space Center, which is not a zoning article. Um, but I will return back to present Article 16 and 17 once that's over. So, Paul, if you just want to stay, um, I can walk everyone through Article 15. Uh, article 15 would just amend a local option to allow what's defined as the South Norwood Business District. Um, which has additional wine and beer licenses. It would extend that area to include the space center so that those licenses would be able to be used by businesses at the state set, at the space center. I think as most of you will know, we are limited in the number of liquor licenses we have. They are granted to us by the state. Sometimes you can create a district. Uh, in this case, we have a South Carolina business district and there's, uh, it's a private petition. So the owner of the space center is putting it forward and it would simply expand the lines of that district so that way those beer and wine licenses would be able to be used at the space center. They still have to go through, of course, any other 
zoning or planning or conservation or health requirements and the selectmen still have to issue the license, but it would just allow them to be used in that area. Um, Chairman Plasco, would you like to speak to this one? Try to throw you on the spot like that, but. I think you've covered it pretty well. All right, does anyone have any questions on Article 15? I've lost my chat box, there we go. Uh, Ann Haley, you have a question? Go right ahead. Yes, um, it seems as though we're asking town meeting to um, approve uh, recommendations for more licenses over the last couple of years. And I was wondering if either you or, or Bill have off the top of your head, how many licenses, extra licenses we have gotten in the town in say the last five years? Uh, not enough, but I would defer to Bill on that one. <laughs> well, uh, we have uh, six down for downtown. You have four for South Node, what that we're discussing right now. You have one for the grassroots uh, organization. You have one for the Norwood Theater. You have a special full liquor instead of beer and wine, specifically for Biblos uh, downtown. And uh, that's all I can remember off the top of my head. Yeah, I, I mean, I would, I don't want to editorialize too much if that answers your question. I think it's ridiculous that the laws in Massachusetts, we have to go to the state legislature when somebody wants a liquor license because we're only allocated a certain amount. It's a really ridiculous business unfriendly process, but nothing we can control. I, I agree with you there, but I just, I, I see, it seemed to me that we were, have been asked to approve or send to the legislature um, requests for extra um, licenses in the past few years. Um, and I don't, I don't know where to stop on this. I, is, which, um, which company is this for? in particular down to space center it's not one in particular um use i know they have a few restaurants that would want to move in there it's just they're looking to build out the area and really what they're looking to do is add the space center to that district so it's not sort of taking them away uh from anywhere in the south Road business district it would just add the space center to that district so that way they'd be able to take advantage of those licenses the state really likes to limit what they give you licenses for so they want you to create districts but then they make them strict within the districts and then they don't like them to transfer uh, outside of the district, um, again, it, it's a it's a funky, outdated system that it should just be up to the licensing authority to decide how many licenses you have, and the free market does take care of you know some things. I mean, our our economic growth is being held back by the inability for the state to just allow us to use liquor licenses as we see fit. The the um, folks who live in in South Norwood have always been fairly vocal about this. Um, have we had any um, discussion with them? And um, if Patty Bailey is still on, if she knows anything, can she speak to that? Um, I would certainly defer to Patty Bailey for this and for a lot of other things as well. Um, we are trying to focus on questions about this. Um, if your question is, do folks in South Norwood have an opinion on it? I suppose we can have Patty represent South Norwood. Thanks. Um, I think that there really should be a little more input from the residents of the area about that. I know back when I was much younger growing up down here, there was a movement to close down a lot of the, um, they were more like bar, neighborhood bars, but there were just so many of them. So I think um, it would be good to open dialogue with uh, the neighbors and just see how they feel about additional liquor licenses coming to the area. Well, let me just point out that, um, as Tony said earlier, these are not, at this point, additional licenses. These we already petitioned for, for along uh, South Norwood, along the Washington Street, and it would allow some of those licenses to be used over at the Space Center. So it's increasing the district, if you will, but it's not increasing the number of licenses. Okay. Thank you. If I could just make a comment quickly. I, I understand that, Mr. Plasco, but I think also that um, you, that whole space center doesn't need to be crammed with just drinking establishments or places that there's all alcohol. I would rather see 
um, a more diverse type um, of businesses in that area instead of just places for alcohol usage. Um, but that's I think, I, think that's a, I think that's a different area, a different argument that you know has merit. I'm not arguing with you. It's just a, the way I heard your earlier comments seemed to be suggesting that we were adding licenses, and I just wanted the facts clear on that. Okay, I yeah. appreciate that, the clarification. Thank you. Yeah, and ju just so everyone's clear before we go to Article 16, these are beer and wine licenses, uh, so it's not a full alcohol license that allows liquor service. It's just beer and wine. And, uh, and one last point, they still need to go through the regular approval process with the Board of Selectmen as a licensing authority. So even though it extends it to that area where the space center is, somebody still has to apply for a license, have a space, go through the selectmen, go through the background checks, and go through any hearings uh, that are required as well. Uh, Paul, if you want to take uh, Article 16. Thank you, Tony. Article 16 is uh, a zoning amendment that will create a new overlay district, a medical services overlay district. As you all recall, back on June 28th, there was a severe rainstorm um, that ended up shutting down Norwood Hospital and it's yet to reopen. The current zoning allows the hospital to be rebuilt within the footprint of those existing buildings. However, future redevelopment or expansion could be problematic due to some of the existing zoning restrictions in place. The hospital currently doesn't comply with the town's um, height limitations for uh, zoning in the general business district. The property right now is zoned general business and the maximum building height in that zone is 30 feet. Over the years, the hospital was required to get a number of different special permits and variances from the zoning board. Um, this particular zoning bylaw amendment um, creating an overlay district will be uh, specific, specific for the hospital and the supported medical related uses. Many other communities that have hospitals have these type of medical services overlay district. Um, in Needham, Beth Israel Deacon's Medical Center, there's a medical services overlay district there. And I know uh, in Weymouth, the social hospital falls within a medical services overlay district. This article is gonna create a new section of the zoning bylaw, section 9.9, .9, medical services overlay district. It'll also amend the official zoning map to show that the boundaries of that zoning district on the zoning map. This slide shows the, uh, in red, the diagonal uh, red hatching identifies the new overlay district boundaries and includes the main um, hospital campus, that block, the block behind it and it extends across East Hoyle Street to a couple of properties that are really underutilized right now. One is used for parking by, by the hospital um, and those properties abut the, uh, the railroad tracks. So they're not all that desirable for um, like residential use. Modern hospital complexes are different than, than what we see in a regular commercial zoning district. Um, they have buildings that are taller than 30 feet. Modern hospital complexes usually have parking garages, heliports, interconnected buildings, ambulance receiving areas. These are all things that are kind of unique to that particular use. Most of them have supporting services like doctor's office, rehab centers, imaging facilities, pharmacies, medical supply and equipment stores, banks, restaurants, florists, the Medical Services Overlay District will permit development, renovation, and relocation of medical and healthcare facilities and services within convenient local and regional access. It'll provide for the healthcare needs of the community and the region within a hospital and customary supporting facilities. It'll create an environment conducive to medical practices and operations in a complex or campus type setting. It'll help to maintain the scale and ensure compatibility with uses within the medical services overlay district and the abutting districts. Um, it will allow parking garages, buildings up to 45 feet high, except for the, the principal hospital building, which would be allowed to be up to 80 feet high. When we met with the hospital officials and had discussions with them about if they were to rebuild, what would they need in terms of building height? They said 80 feet. 
this will also allow for Hellport. We have one now. It'll allow for that in the future. The activities associated within the medical services overlay district will provide for and maintain protection of the neighboring hospitals, and be convenient and safe for vehicles and pedestrian movement within the district. The planning board will be the special permit granting authority within this new medical services overlay district. The planning board and the board of selectmen met and discussed the boundaries of the district and the bylaw amendment and both boards voted to support this particular article. I would be glad to answer any questions on it. Um, before we go to Paul for specific questions about the zoning, just to give everyone an update on the hospital, we continue to not get a lot of information from Stewart other than they're working through their insurance process. Um, obviously submitting a 150 or 200 million dollar full replacement claim is a lengthy and complicated process i think we're all frustrated it's taken this long uh they've recently told us they anticipate uh, a big announcement hopefully we saw a positive one um come april or may uh but they were happy that the zoning was at least proactive so it's one less step that they will need to um take when the time uh comes and uh, i've spoken in a couple of select have spoken to with the representatives of the mass nurses association who are very much in favor of this to um, help get the hospital back as soon as possible. I think as everyone knows, we lost 1400 jobs when the hospital closed a lot of money out of the local economy um, and a new bigger hospital would certainly be um, the best possible thing for us. As Paul said, the actual zoning on the site doesn't remotely relate to the hospital. Sometimes institutions like this that are around for so long, the zoning just becomes uh, convoluted. We joke that you couldn't actually build the hospital the way it is today with the zoning that's allowed and you wouldn't build the hospital the way it is today. Uh, that being said, we'd be happy to answer any questions anyone has. All right, we can always jump back to Paul if you want to go ahead to um, Article 18. Yes, I will. It, there's actually one more point about um, the Medical Services Overlay District that I didn't mention, and that is the fact that it is an overlay district and the underlying general business zone will still remain in place, which means any of the current uses that are allowed in the general business district can continue to allow um, now and in the future. In the event that the hospital decides that they're gonna tear down one building or tear down all the building, this particular bylaw amendment will set the table for that and plan ahead for the future. Last but not least is my, my last in the, in the six pack of uh, zoning amendments for town meeting. And that is a, an article that will amend the uh, landscaping and screening regulations in the zoning bylaw. And that's section 6.4. So our green article. So we went with the green background. Um, and about the lime green, I might have to change that. Um, the landscape bylaw is going to um, affect be applicable to, in effect, new commercial development, redevelopment, big commercial additions, changes of use of buildings that trigger the need for a site plan review from the planning board. So if this passes a town meeting, uh, the commercial uh, property owners don't have to go out and start planting more trees and bushes. This only affects uh, commercial properties when they're making some kind of a change or they're being redeveloped. This bio amendment will improve the appearance of our commercial properties. It will require a, a wider variety of landscape plantings. It will promote seasonal flowers and perennials. It will help to reduce impervious surfaces and promote ecological diversity. It will reduce the impacts of climate change. I mentioned earlier the, the urban heat sink effect it's real and and while something like this will not have a big effect on helping to address climate change everyone in every community needs to work together to make small steps to help address the impacts of climate change and by making our parking lot smaller by requiring more landscaped islands and landscape buffers that's something that we can do here in norwood it'll also help beautify the town but it'll help to address the issues of climate change it will help to um, sequester carbon, increase groundwater recharge, and when commercial properties look better, it increases their value. Right now, our current bylaw only allows evergreen shrubs and trees. And I found this out when we were reviewing um, the landscaping for the new McDonald's that was built up on uh, Route 1 and Everett Street. Uh, the, the landscape architect had over a hundred um, inkberry bushes 
these are little green bushes with little black berries. And um, they had a hundred of them. And I scratched my head and said, you know, this guy's only got one type of bush he wants to plant here. Why doesn't he plant some other bushes? What about some forsythias or lilacs, things that we love to see bloom in the springtime? And he pointed out to me, Paul, your Bible doesn't allow that. We don't allow flowering shrubs and seasonal flowers. Um, and so uh, this bio amendment will uh, address the, the minimum number of trees and shrubs um, that will have to be planted on these commercial sites. It will require a mix of trees and perennials and flowers. It will increase the amount of land that's required for landscaping within commercial parking lots, currently at 2%, and that will increase to 5%. It will increase the number of trees that are required from one tree every 40 feet to one tree every 30 feet. The bylaw doesn't really mention some of the basics of uh, landscape design. And, and these are things that we wanna get into the bylaw and require native species, drought tolerant, insect resistant and disease resistant species. It'll help improve the, the way these commercial properties look, it'll help improve the environment and it will create some more green space. This article was recommended by the planning board and, it really, and, and the board of selectmen. This article came about um, as a result of several years of planning board approving commercial properties and asking uh, those, those developers to add more landscaping above and beyond what the zoning bylaw required. And um, that's usually, you know, we wanna have people comply with the bylaw, but we can't force them to go beyond that. After um, you know some wrestling matches over more bushes and trees um, over the years, we decided that it was time to update our bylaw and make uh, more landscaping uh, requirements and allow more variety and flexibility. And that's what this bylaw amendment will do. I'd be glad to answer any questions on this, Tony. All right, I don't believe we have any as yet. Does anyone have any questions for this one, the uh, landscape bylaw? No? All right, we are plugging right along here. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. We'll just take a minute here to switch over to myself as the uh, screen sharer, sharer -er. Uh Joe, if you want to make me the um, host again so I can grab my screen. I'm going to be with everyone in just a second. Actually, Paul, could you make Tony the host again? Um, let's see. All right, I shut mine off, and I think that should hand it off to Tony. Uh, you're still a host. You're going to make me the host again. All right. We've been in Zoom webinar training mode for so long that I now don't remember how to use the non-webinar version of Zoom. Mm. You just should have to click on my name and click more and then, uh, you know, make hoster. While we work on that, I can uh, start on Article 18, which is an addition, it's another petition for an additional liquor license. Um, this is by um, the Shelby family who own Rojo's, and it's uh, 69 Boston Providence Highway, so it's on Route 1, and it would be an additional liquor license for cravings on the go, is what they're calling it. So this is not a sort of drinking at a bar liquor license, this is a package license. And again, we are out of those licenses. So it's a private petition supported by the selectmen seeking to um, add one additional, to petition the legislature for an additional liquor license. And uh, as I said, town meeting needs to approve it, legislature needs to approve it, it needs to come back and they still need to go through uh, the process for, um, for that liquor license. And I'll have my screen up here in just a second for everyone. I made you the host, Tony, is that working? Thank you. Yep, give me just a second here. All right. And we'll be ready to go. All right, can everyone see my screen now? Yes, Tony. Thank you. All right, so that is Article 18. Any questions on Article 18, which is a petition for an additional liquor license? It's a retail license, not a... Correct, retail license. All right. We'll move on. 
Uh, next article. Oh, yep, go ahead. Some good question. Uh, yeah, it's Ed Ferris. Go ahead, Ed. Um, they're looking for this for inside the current rojos. They they have a little plaza there. A few, a couple of there's a dry cleaners and insurance. Yeah, agency. it's got the spa, the insurance agency, the car. And there's a stove store just around the corner, the car washes, and then they have a, a one or two empty bays. And as I understand it, this spring they plan to do those over and develop a store or a business that they're mm -hmm. calling Cravings on the Go. And they would like to be able to sell beer and uh, wine from that location if they can get a license. This is a little different from the others we're always talking about, which are on-premise licenses. This is the first one that I can remember, at least in the town of Norwood, that someone's looked for a um, package store license to, to uh, have an additional license granted. Kind of going back to a question that Ms. Haley brought up or asked earlier, the state seems to change their attitude from time to time and maybe depending on who's the chairman of the committee that oversees this. The most current uh, situation that we're told is that the chairman doesn't like to issue additional liquor licenses. They typically will look at them when they're earmarked for a particular area or a particular business and are somehow tied to economic development. And that's up to them to decide what is or isn't to meet their criteria. They usually also, when they issue additional licenses today, put a, uh, a sun sunset clause on them. So if the town asks for uh, a license and then doesn't issue it within three years or five years, whatever they put in their uh, legislation, then the town loses the opportunity to issue it to anyone else. It goes away. And this is on petition of the uh, property owners or the business owners, not the uh, not the not the town. Yeah, it's just it. I don't know. I'm I'm thinking about what what Ann said, and the combination of gas and liquor makes me wonder <laughs> when we, you bring them into the same space. We 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 had uh, that. Concern a while back, and I'm not going to say that we necessarily made the right decision, but that already exists in town. The mobile yes. gas station on the corner of Route 1 and Dean Street does have a beer and wine license. Yeah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Massachusetts is still a little different in how we approach um, liquor and beer sales. Um, I, I worked in Vermont, and you did not have a gas station that did not also sell beer, wine, and milk. Um, but it's just, it's a different world here in Massachusetts. It's a little different. I, I agree with you, Ed, although I would hope people could, you know, get their gas and get their beer and at least get most of the way home before they open the beer. But, you know, it might be wishful thinking. Uh, yeah, no, it's, I, I think of it more of the, uh, rural as opposed to the urban setting. Yeah. And, uh, when you start putting together potential combustibles and combining them in one location, in an urban setting where the density is higher, there's concerns there, and I don't want to think through all of them right now, but it just comes to mind. Valid point. It's certainly new new and a little different to, to us here. And again, this is a private petition of the property owner. Uh, other questions on Article 19? All right, keep plugging along here. Uh, Article 20 would adopt a provision of um, Chapter 59 SN as it relates to veterans. So we currently have a senior tax work-off program. And about a year ago, we adopted an option on the senior tax work-off program that lets somebody work for a senior if that senior happens to be disabled or unable to actually um, perform any work for the town. What this allows us to do is um, not only have a um, veterans do the program, so veterans can actually get the same program that uh, seniors do for ta the tax work-off program, it would also make sure that we allow veterans who are disabled. Uh, oh, I skipped the article 19 on the overlay. I'll go back to that, Bob. Right, right. But this, would also, <laughs> this would also allow, uh, we just keep forgetting about that overlay this year. Um, this would also allow disa uh, a veteran who's disabled to have somebody basically do the work for them. So it basically takes the senior citizen program that we have for the senior tax work off and exactly mirrors it and allows veterans to do the same thing. Same parameters, same requirements. Uh, any questions on this? 
fairly straightforward. Again, the state makes us go through town meeting to, uh, to adopt it. Uh, we're going to go back to Article 19 because this overlay we just can't seem to stop forgetting about. So as I said earlier, every year we, we have to set up what's known as an overlay. And um, it's a just money for abatements or exemptions or if the budget needs to balance that uh, to get the tax rate to set. We originally went in with a certain budget plan and local receipts flat because the state had told us back in June, go ahead and do that. Just leave it where it is because the numbers are all over the place. When we went to set the tax rate, they said, no, those numbers aren't good. You've got to back your local receipts off $350,000. So the way that the state does that to get your budget balanced because it's after town meeting is they take it out of your overlay, but we cannot drop the overlay down that low. So uh, we need to allocate money out of free cash to bring the overlay back up to where we need it to be to safely be able to cover all of our abatements and exemptions. It's historically been around this million dollar number. Um, it, we raised it a little bit to account for some of the additional exemptions that we're looking at doing and the abatements to make sure we had enough uh, funding in there for those programs, but uh, we're one of the, we're rare in that we don't usually have any overlay left over. Some communities after a couple of years will, um, uh, will have a lot of overlay left over and they'll transfer that overlay surplus. We've never really done it. We pretty much come right under the wire with this, but one way or another, we, you know, if we didn't do this, then come the spring, once the abatements or uh, exemptions have gone over that $700,000 number, which they surely do, because they generally do every year, um, we would need to make that money up some point anyway. So this just takes money from free cash to make sure that we're back at what the overlay should have been. Uh, specific specific questions on the um, tax overlay. We call it the budget overlay. It's really not a budget overlay. We can't use it for anything other than um, exemptions and abatements. Tony, and this just this is from our free cash reserve. As yes. A All right, we'll jump on to Article 21. Article 21 is a local option which allows us to place liens for unpaid um, fees and fines. So currently, if a, uh, let's say the health department issues you a fine for having trash on your lawn and you choose not to pay that fine, realistically, the only way the town ever can collect some of those fines is by going to court. It rarely, if ever, makes sense to go to court, uh, especially even if the fines pile up, even if they're daily fines. Judges always like to get rid of them. What ends up happening is we spend a lot of money on legal fees. We are fighting after somebody and the judge will say, oh, well, you owe $3,000 in fees. Well, we're going to waive it. Just fix the problem and go away there. So to ensure that we can actually collect some of that money and to ensure some ability to sure make people want to follow our, our zoning bylaws and our health codes, this allows us to assess that fee as a lien and collect it the same way we would do with water, sewer, or um, electric on an owned property. So likelihood is if you have some fi fines from the town for zoning issues or health issues and you just never pay them currently, we almost never do anything. Um, but this would at least give us the ability to say, no, you, you should pay what you owe for your zoning or your um, health violation. So anyone who's particularly interested in um, enforcement of the health codes and enforcement of the zoning bylaws, this at least will ensure we'll likely get those fees back. Uh, any questions on this? All right, plugging the right along. We are the government, so we like to charge fees for different things. Um, this is what we're calling, it's called the Airbnb tax. This adds a 3% surcharge on top of the regular hotel tax to short-term rentals. So not just Airbnb, it could be um, via another site, um, but this would make ensure that if you are renting on Airbnb, this additional 3% fee is levied. Of course, the person actually paying the rental fee pays for it. Uh, we'll eventually bring in a little bit of additional revenue for the town. Not much. We do predict once the skating club is up and running and once we're past COVID, they're going to need thousands, if not tens of thousands of hotel rooms per year. So we expect the Airbnb to be sort of a growing um, market for us. It, it helps address a little bit of the inequity that... Um, comes from, you know, you can sort of rent your house out, but a hotel has to follow the commercial tax rates. They have to follow a whole lot of other uh, regulations that you don't own in Airbnb. So it's just a 3% surcharge on top of that. Uh, for Airbnb, this does not apply to general property rentals. So if you own a two family home, this doesn't apply to you, you know, your month to month lease with your tenant uh, downstairs from you. Questions on the local options for short term rentals. 
Just uh, two other quick points on this. Uh, because the state likes to do funny things, we have to direct it to infrastructure or affordable housing. Uh, since we have CPA money for affordable housing, we figured we'd put this towards infrastructure. Now, until we start receiving substantial amounts of money, it's probably not going to be a whole lot. It might be a couple thousand dollars a year. But if we do see large growth in Airbnb and short-term rentals down the road, it could be nice to get an extra street paved every five or six years. Uh, and somebody actually sent me a message that maybe we should consider doing an Airbnb at the Morse house. Could be a great revenue generator for the town. Uh, Article 23 is a revolving fund for uh, fees from tobacco enforcement. So here's sort of another funny situation where the state's done something kind of funny. When we have a tobacco enforcement fine, so that's when somebody sells to a minor, or um, there's a number of other uh, fines. If they sell to a minor, they can sell unlicensed cigarettes or anything like that. The state has dramatically raised the fees. It's, I think, $1,000, $3,000, and $5,000 for a first, second, and third offense. Um, none of our fines come anywhere near anything like that. It's, um, I'm very surprised that they did that. So what the health department wants to do is um, set up a revolving fund so that any money received from these fines goes into that revolving fund. And then the money just gets used for additional enforcement. So we, we usually contract with companies to come out and do tests or education town-wide or school-wide on uh, tobacco enforcement to try to deal with the perception or perceived perception that we're just trying to find people to make the town money or balance the budget. Um, and these are significant fines. So we'd rather make sure that that money stays in that revolving fund and goes just towards additional enforcement and education to hopefully get to a point where it's there's um there's no enforcement issues because these are these are substantial. We would never get away with being able to charge somebody a thousand dollar fine for something, but the state gets to make the laws. Uh, we don't. So the idea is to try to make that a little bit more gentle by saying, look, at you've gotten fined three thousand dollars this year, but it's just going into right back into enforcement and education. Questions on Article Twenty Three revolving funds for tobacco enforcement. Right. Yeah. Hey, Tony. Oh, yep. Go uh, ahead. Question on uh, the revolving fund. Yep. So what would that look like in the case of they do start getting money into it? The fund starts filling up. Um, obviously, it'd be a budget item because it'd be a revolving fund attached to the health department. Is that correct? Well, it would be assigned to the health department. So the only money that goes in there is if a fine is levied. So we could go the next five years and nobody could get fined from any enforcement issues and there's no money that goes in there. When that money goes in there, the health department, like our other revolving funds, would spend it with the parameters set by the fund, which uh, the fund by law, which is here, which is just tobacco enforcement and um, education. But that would be administered directly by the health department then? Uh, correct. Similar to our senior center uh, revolving fund, our rec department okay. revolving fund. I will tell you, if we start accumulating fifty or sixty or seventy thousand dollars in this fund a year, we've got a major problem. Um, what we're anticipating is, for a couple of years, you might get five, six, seven thousand dollars in there, and the health department doesn't want to get in trouble for collecting ridiculous fees and just say, "Look, it's going just into enforcement and education." And hopefully, it'll do away with all of it. Where it'll just be once every couple of years, somebody gets dinged for something, and as a result, they get a little bit of money and they go do education or enforcement. Yeah, I was actually thinking the opposite of that, that we wouldn't get a whole lot into it and anything that would get in there might turn into a, uh, you know, a red tape nightmare in how the money is managed and transferred and tracked, especially if we have to do any kind of voting against it. That was a bigger concern. Yeah, it's just so there was the enforcement that we do is we hire a company that comes in and um, their service and then they do sort of tests. They'll send a 16 year old kid into a store that sells tobacco. Can you sell to them? Just the same way we do liquor enforcement, um, although the police tend to do that um, directly. So there shouldn't be a lot of money going to this. But if you think of store, small business owner who understandably kind of breaks the law or makes a stupid decision and maybe sells an underage kid tobacco, these are substantial fines and in, in it could cause issues with people thinking the health department's out there to levy these fines. They're not. We would have been fine with our fine network otherwise, but the state has now set these fines. So the idea is if it's a couple thousand dollars a year, it's just a little additional enforcement. And um, it'll also um, just give them, if they want to do an education program in the schools, bring in a counselor or something to talk to kids or something like that. But it's just education and enforcement of tobacco. Doesn't pay for salaries, doesn't pay for office expenses or anything like that.
A uh, question from Ann Haley. Uh, Ann, you got to unmute yourself. And then Tony Esco will get to you next. Uh, we'll okay, get to you. We set, up, um, we set up revolving funds for the senior center and for the library, and they both report back to town meeting every year. Yep. And will this be set up exactly the same way? Yeah, absolutely. It's just another revolving fund. It's just, it's a much more specific revolving fund because there's a very specific um, revenue source identified. Okay. I, because, because there is a difference between what happens with the senior center and the library in reporting back to town meeting every year um, versus what we do with the, um, um, yeah, sure. The, yeah, the rec um, center is a little bit different because the, yeah, the rec right center right. and that sort of thing. So this would be the most simple of any revolving fund. So I just wanted to be clear that it would be along the lines of the library and the um, uh, senior center. Correct. It's exactly the same thing, just far okay. more restrictive. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Tony Esco, I'll get to your question. We jump to Article Twenty Four in just a moment. Uh, other questions on Article Twenty Three. All right. Article 24 is a bylaw change that would modernize the PBCC or Permanent Building Construction Committee bylaw function by recognizing the role that the new facilities department plays. We have a bylaw structure around how we operate, operated last year. Now that we have a facilities department, we're looking to make some changes related to that, as well as um, looking at the reality of cost of construction and that some, the way we're required to manage certain construction projects has actually changed under state law. Norwood was ahead of its times in creating a PBCC. The state has finally caught up with requirements for project managers and for procurement and for other items. Um, Tony Eskel's question is, does Article 24 render the PBC completely defunct from now on? What is the future of the PBCC, if any? Uh, the answer is absolutely not. Um, the PBCC, in some ways, isn't changing. We're just not necessarily going under any major construction projects lately. What's happened with the PBCC in the last 10 years is the town really hasn't built that many new buildings. You know, we have, we had the DPW building, we had the, um, the bathhouse, but mostly what we're doing are renovation projects. And some of them are relatively small scale that you normally wouldn't put to a building committee to do a roof on a building, uh, especially when you got to pay $100,000 to hire a project manager um, and items like that. The next large building that we're going to construct, really not sure. We might be doing a major renovation at Town Hall at some point in the future. But we haven't found the 20 million bucks to do that yet. Um, so it doesn't render them um, ineffective or doesn't render them um, defunct. What happened is we started getting small repair projects that were trying to be coordinated by a committee. And the complexity of our procurement laws and our financial laws and how we have to manage the money doesn't always work with uh, a committee for a $60,000 uh, window renovation project. And we now have a facilities department, a town-wide facilities department that the taxpayers have invested in that has probably already saved us more than it cost us this year with a handful of projects alone. So we're moving in that direction that eventually the PVCC can go back to being a building construction committee when and if we have um, new buildings being constructed. Uh, questions on Article 24? Uh, Ann Haley, go right ahead. Um, I, you know, I was, I was thinking about the Morse house and um, that project now will the PBCC have something to do with that because that that will be a significant amount of money um, and and the other part of that question is will the um, facilities department work on that so uh, both good questions both really good questions the bylaw sets a dollar threshold where the PBCC takes over uh, and where those projects all of a sudden become sort of PBCC eligible. Will the Morse House work hit that threshold? Um, the short answer is I don't know. Um, it depends on A, what needs to get done at the Morse House, and then there may be some decisional uh, questions we want to make. Uh, Tony brought up a great point earlier. I don't know if you could ever really make the second floor of the Morse House handicap accessible because it's got some multi-levels there, um, but anything along those lines would all of a sudden jump that project cost up quite a bit. The Morse House is in reasonably good shape. It might just need some exterior work and windows and doors and you know what the cost is gonna become, we gotta get through the feasibility study to see that. So it sort of depends on what we end up needing to do and then what we decide to do. 
The same thing about your second question with the PVCC being involved, it really depends on looking at, well, what does the house need? And then also with the facilities department, what does the house need? And what are we looking at doing? If it's uh, replacing a furnace, and I don't think that the furnace there needs to be replaced. I think, it, I think it's in good shape. Um, it's really a residential furnace. That's not a complicated job. The facilities department would keep an eye on that. If you're talking about, you know, tearing down the whole exterior and, you know, going through a project where you need an OPM, facilities would definitely be involved in that. They can do maintenance on the building. They're not historic preservation uh, specialists. So again, it depends on the, really, we're going to see what needs to be done and then decide what we need to get done. Yeah, I think the Morse house is actually in pretty good shape. There may be things we want to do, but, uh, you know, I haven't been to the South Norwood Christmas party in a couple of years because I think we obviously couldn't have it. Uh, this year and then we didn't have it last year but the house is in pretty good shape it does need some work but it may end up being that it's a a lot of painting um work which facilities would oversee but we would want to bring in a specialized company for that so short answer is probably <laughs> depending on how big okay. the project ends up getting thank uh, you additional questions on article uh what is the dollar amount that shifts work from the pbcc to facilities uh, i'd have to look at the article it's in the eight or nine hundred thousand dollar range um where it is where at that point it's looking at a um a larger construction project to make sure that smaller projects don't necessarily trigger the pbcc and then there's still sort of an iterative process in there where you know we're we talking about just a roof where it may exceed that amount but it is just a roof and it's not that complicated um, they'd really be doing almost anything that is stick up built, we would probably be having the PVCC look at. But facilities will have a role to play and they'll sort of be our lead now in buildings. Because remember that they're them being responsible now for maintaining all of our facilities and managing our buildings, they now basically take the lead with the PVCC. So great, great question, Ed. Bylaw changes related to the PBCC. Additional questions? And again, we can always come back to them. Article 25, one of the uh, most redundant things we have to do in municipal management. Um, unpaid bills. Uh, I'll defer to Tom if we have a few unpaid bills. It's, you know, state statute is kind of funny because we're required to get an appropriation for unpaid bills. So that's a bill that is um, from the previous fiscal year but wasn't paid out of the previous fiscal year for any number of reasons. State law also says any legal bill that's brought before the town, we have the authority to pay and we have to pay. So this is one of those laws that was originally intended to prevent the shifting of large expenses from one year to another, similar to the way a company would do it to make their balance sheet look better or look worse. You know, let's hold off on a health insurance payment. Um, it was really actually designed for the cities because their councils can just make those changes. We have to go to town meeting. That being said, the interpretation has always been if you have a bill from a previous year, you have to get an appropriation from the, uh, the current year. Oftentimes these end up being small bills that we just got built after we build after we close out our books or a vendor was late. Um, sometimes what you end up happening is with our utility bills um, close out one part of the year and then we're starting the next year's budget. I know we did have one. I don't know if it's this year or last year with the fire department as an example. They had $9,000 left in a budget line and had a bill show up July 20th for that $9,000. It hadn't been encumbered. We closed the books. It's just a, um, a quirk of laws in Massachusetts that we have to deal with. And oftentimes, as those of you who are veteran town meeting members know, we have to get all the way to this article to appropriate, you know, $47 for, you know, a bill left over from last year because a postage bill or something. Sometimes they're more substantial than that. And it requires a nine tenths vote town meeting um, for whatever reason. But as I said, the law says we have to pay a legal bill anyway. Um, Mr. McQuaid, do we, in our final analysis, if you're still with us, uh, do we have unpaid bills? Uh, twelve thousand oh sixty three. So <clears throat> there's a bill for the zoning board of appeals that's actually goes back to February of nineteen. It's one hundred and forty eight dollars, and just I don't know why I never never get paid, and the vendors are looking for the money. Uh, there's a fire department. A uh, small, small one of 368 and another fire department of 2,532. That had to do with a Motorola uh, system and maintenance that was done on it. And there's a $9,000 maintenance bill for the police department from Tesla Systems. So, uh, and then there's a $14 bill from 
American Vacuum. So the total is 12063 That fire department building or public safety building bill, I remember, um, was a case where the, the money was in the budget, the year closed, and then the bill came, and we can't go back and, and fix it. So just a, a quirk of accounting. And, you know, that $14 vacuum repair bill is... I should have just paid that out of my pocket. Uh, questions on unpaid bills or Article 25? No? All right, everyone. That brings us to the end of the uh, warrant, if you will. I will stop sharing my screen here. Um... Uh, Tony, uh, earlier I, I had uh, circulated the motions and uh, the financial motions to the FinCom and Ann Haley pointed out I missed Article 19. So I have gone back and corrected that and they are posted on the town website for the town meeting. We just can't so, get away from that overlay. We, yeah, we, don't have, uh, we don't have all of the motions for all of the articles on there, but I do have all the financial ones. So we don't have all the motions for- uh, Yeah, the town council still reviewing them. Does anyone have questions on any of the articles we've discussed tonight? Any of the land use articles? Any of the uh, any articles? Bob Donnelly has moved to adjourn. Uh, I will take that as a motion to adjourn. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, this was recorded by NCM. It will be on NCM uh, and replayed constantly. And it will be on our um, website and our social media as well. Any questions, you can always email the planning department, finance, the manager's office, the selectmen, absolutely anyone. So thank you all. And we will see you next week at town meeting. Thanks everyone.